What's up and welcome back to Monday. You know we're going to have a kick-ass episode for you. Before we get into it, let's talk about the brand that makes this podcast possible. That's right, BlackRifleCoffee.com. Shall we go to their website right now? Ooh, Flying Elk Coffee. This is part of the ECS subscription, Evans Coffee subscription. The Flying Elk, I am stoked that this thing is making a return. Um, I swear I've had it before, just because how many times do you see an elk with wings? Not very often, except for maybe when you're dreaming or on DMT, I guess, having never done TMT. I don't know if that's the case. However, the ECS is pretty badass. You don't get a lot of coffee, but you get one bag per month. Evan has a heavy hand in selecting not only the roast, but it comes with uh, suggested ways to make the coffee as well, to express the characteristics in the manner that he would want you to exp uh, explore it. Uh, join now while there's still slots available would be my suggestion. If you slide down, you don't know what you like about Black Rifle Coffee. Again, this banner right here that goes from light to dark. Explore to your heart's content, and if you click on any of these bags, it'll tell you the tasting notes, uh, you know, everything you would want to know about it. And then if you want to kick ass apparel, go to the apparel button. Shockingly enough, if you click on the gear button, you're going to find gear. Coffee bundles will have, wait for it, bundles of things that you could make coffee with or bundles themselves. And the coffee sampler is, as expected, a sampling of their coffee, and at the bottom is the best sellers. So as I have said many times... I'm a huge fan of Black Rifle Coffee, not just for the coffee. I actually found coffee late in late, uh, life, my late 20s, but the people who founded it and what they stand for. So if you want to support the podcast, do me a favor, support Black Rifle Coffee and head over to blackriflecoffee.com. Let's talk about my guest today. I need to find his bio. There it is. His name is Dr. Chris Free. Is a PhD a clinical psychologist by training, and a professor of psychology at the University of Hawaii in Hilo. He has over 30 years of professional experience working with military veterans and active duty personnel, and has conducted clinical trials, epidemiology, historical, and neuroscience research. He has co-authored over 300 scientific publications, which is over 300 more than I ever have, because I'm at zero right now, including a graduate textbook on adult psychopathy. Uh, my interest is that he wrote a book called Operator Syndrome, which is a term that I absolutely hate because it's so accurate. It is, you know, there's the cost and then there's the price. The cost of military service is relatively straightforward. It's, these are the things that you're going to be expected to do. This is what you're going to get paid. This is your contract, all of these things. Okay, but what's the price? The price is things like Operator Syndrome concussive blast, concussions, uh, exposure to repeated trauma, violence, death, destruction, all of those things. His book does a really good job of explaining what you may well expect on the tail end of one of those careers or what you might experience on your way through it. Chris has testified before Congress, served as a paid contributor or contractor, I should say, for the Department of Defense, the Veterans Affairs and U.S. State Department, and the National Board of Medical Examiners. He's worked deeply with veterans for a long time, and we get into that pretty deeply in this episode. So how about we just begin episode number 326 with Dr. Chris Free. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. I mean, what are you trying to pull here? All right. Just because you're a PhD doesn't mean you get to spell your name in a fancy way. That's like me saying A-N-D-I. You know what? It's El <laughs> it, it is, I'll tell you who, who did it. It's Ellis Island. Okay. That's fair. Oh, they changed it from something else. Yeah. Yeah. 1902, 1901. Would they do that when they, the person doing the onboarding couldn't figure out the pronunciation or spelling of the last name? <sighs> this is an interesting question. People come to America, they were never really all that welcome in a lot of ways, especially, you know, people coming, right, getting right off the boat. So my great-grandfather, great one great, was German and brought his, came over. Yeah. And the, the original spelling would have been completely impossible because it would have been F-R-U-H, but the U would have had the umlaut, the two dots over it. Yep. 
and even I can't pronounce it. Okay. It, the literal translation was meant early. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what stumpf means in German. I would assume like chiseled or awesome or handsome. <laughs> that would be my guess. Certainly. Off the top of my head. <laughs> Probably means like badass. No, it probably means like gardener snake or like shovel, some <laughs> ridiculous name. Um, I see, you know, a little PhD on the end there. What'd you get your doctorate in? Uh, clinical psychology, which I'm a little embarrassed to say to admit these days, but yes, I am a psychologist. Why would you be embarrassed to admit that? Well, it's more about what's happened to the field of psychology, clinical psychology in particular. Uh, it's become very ideological. How? I know almost nothing about the field. How has it changed in your time? Oh, massively. Well, I think, I think, hmm. So the last, oh, I mean, it's become gradually more ideologically woke, progressive mm -hmm. woke. And you can see this if you uh, pay much attention to what's happening in the, the veterans affairs system. Which I am not. What's going on there? Oof. Well, that's part of the conversation, I think. We have terabytes of hard drive space, so we're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll, we can talk about that. Yeah. So you want to start there? The VA is a... is a So... As long as... I mean, we can go and start wherever you want to. I'm just... Um, I don't know if I've had many opportunities to sit down with a clinical mm -hmm. you know, psychologist. Um, you, do you need an evaluation? We could do that, too. Feel free. I can tell you right now. I'm batshit crazy. My moral compass is very oriented in the right direction, but I have boundaries that I'm willing to cross that others are not to achieve said direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes with the training, doesn't it? The indoc. Because the training. The indoc, the training, the, the he, life. The, here's the question the I bounce. But the question I bounce up against is is it the training that refines people? into that place mm, mm -hmm. or do people who are naturally have those tendencies mm -hmm. find that type of occupation? Yeah, that's, that's the right, that's one of the right questions. And I don't know the answer. I don't think Nor any, do I. I don't think anybody does. You, you can look at the attempts to make predictions about who will pass selection. <laughs> they spent tens of millions of dollars. That's on right. This. That's yeah. right. And nobody's <laughs> nobody's been able to figure it out. I know nobody's been able to figure it out. And you can go back to the early OSS efforts, um, World War II, when they, when the Allies realized that all of the operatives they were dropping into uh, occupied Europe, France, Yugoslavia, Italy, um, everywhere, were quickly being rolled up and tortured and executed, largely because, or at least heavily because they weren't ready and they weren't I think part of it was they weren't selected properly and so that became the question is how do we how do we find how do we choose how do we identify who's going to be able to do this uh, crazy scary dangerous job effectively so there was an entire uh, program set up in northern Virginia it was actually a I think a large house out in the country hmm. And they, they stocked that house with a bunch of psychologists and psychiatrists from Stanford, Harvard, and a few other places. And basically just said, we're going to just start sending you people who have volunteered and help us figure out who can do this and, and who to just send back to us. Interesting. And, and it's a pretty phenomenal effort that they did. Um, in fact, it was so successful that they were starting to set up a, an equivalent program in California to target Japan and the and the Pacific and the war ended before that that got off the ground uh, why is it that you think that I mean the DOD has spent a lot of time probably because they were mandated to do so there, there was a desire to increase the number of special operations soldiers military-wide they I mean they personality tests they looked at background single mm -hmm. parent you know, nuclear family, what sports did you play? What age are you? What are your physical attributes? And they still cannot tell with any level of accuracy. Yeah. Why yeah. do you think that is? Because I can tell you as somebody who went through and as somebody who applied the curriculum, mm -hmm. everybody says, it's, you know, it's, it's mentally tough and physically easy. That's not actually a correct statement. It is physically very hard. Right. But the muscle that fails in that program is not below the neck. It's above the neck. Well, it's all connected. Sure. And 
that's maybe something that we have failed to really fully appreciate on the back end, the later stage end of things. So there is probably multi-factor, many factors. So you've got the genetics that you, you were born with. You've got the life experiences. A lot of guys that, that made it through the selection, uh, at least from what I've seen, have childhood adversity. Um, Would you characterize that as trauma? For some. I didn't. And I, God, I'm so glad you're here because I can ask questions about somebody who understands the brain. I have hypotheses about the brain. Mm-hmm. I'm an idiot, though, so probably people should use my hypotheses with a cream. I didn't realize when I was in the number of people that I served with who came from environments that I would consider to be traumatic. Yep. And it makes more sense to me looking back at it. If you didn't want to gener- if you didn't know what to do, but you realized you hated what was happening to you, mm-hmm. what an amazing outlet to go hunt down and stop those that may be traumatizing Mm. other. Oh, yeah. But I think the issue is, in that process of doing so, it's not fixing anything that happened to you and you still had that trauma. And then you see people who are exiting the military who they dedicated their life to those things, but I don't know, and I can't speak for everybody, obviously, but absent putting in a substantial amount of effort to fix yourself as well, you're still left with that trauma at the end, plus the trauma that comes with the things that they ask us to do. And to me, not that you can point a clear indicator to the reasons that people struggle when they get up, because there are a variety from isolation to substance abuse, whatever it may be. Injuries. Injuries. Operator syndrome. Yeah. Moral injury, physical injury, the combination of those things. Brain. Yeah. I, I wonder if that job is more enticing to people who are coming from a traumatic background because of how they view what you're able to do with it and to stop other people being traumatized. Yeah. Well, so how was your childhood? I won the, I won the parental lottery. Okay. My parents were yeah. awesome. Yeah. Are they still alive? My mother passed from cancer in 2010. My father is still alive. Did they, were they married all the way until her, her passing? Yes. Okay. And your, do you have siblings? I have one sister. Okay. Older. And how's she doing? I mean, she's alive. <laughs> she's doing fine. She's got Michael's like, oh my God. She has a family of her own. Um, very successful career in uh, medicine, specifically nurse practitioner. Two children, husband who's a uh, firefighter, firefighter captain. Okay. Yeah. So he, successful. I did not come from a background of trauma. Yeah. And one thing that we didn't, I mean, you would think that because of the close proximity that we worked with people, and perhaps it's just an anomaly in the conversations that I didn't have, I don't remember a single time like, Hey, Bob, was your childhood fucked up? You know, when you're in the team room, yeah, like putting yeah, your gear yeah. together. Well, but I've had more of those conversations with the guys afterwards. Yeah. And, it, and I have no data to support it. But it seems like the number of people who have a background that I would say and qualify as traumatic is higher than I would expect. Yeah. Well, you know, it is interesting. And so what happens from a, chi- from a traumatic childhood? You, you know, many people are are damaged. Many people come out really hurt and never become functional later in life. Other people become hyper-functional. Other people, you know, I think there's there's sort of a fork in the road that Mm. that occurs for many people. And sometimes people are, are, you know, compensating. I mean, Tom Brady was, when was he picked? Six round pick? I believe, there's there's a name for the, he was the last person picked in the draft. Oh, Mr. Irrelevant? That's Michael, the that's the yeah, name, Mister. Yeah. Sure, that's what it is. The uh, last dude picked in the last round was that Tom Brady. It was. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was. Okay, in the year that he got drafted. Well, so but whether it was the sixth round or the end of the seventh round, the man played his entire career with a chip on his shoulder. Yeah, and and I think that became part of what drove him. Uh, I have a, a friend, a good friend, uh, Derek Natalini. He's quoted in the book. He was a. Uh, uh, Delta operator for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. I don't know exactly. But he, just in conversation one day, uh, he referred to it as the ambition of shame. Hmm. That the shame of, of those childhood experiences for many, and at the time that he said this to me, 
he was working for the Operator Relief Foundation. So he was talking with a lot of operators about their injuries and their their psychological and physical injuries, and he was helping to, to help put together, you know, treatment programs for them. He refers to it as the ambition of shame. Seen it over and over again. I've seen it over and over again. Other people that I've talked to have seen it over and over again, that it there seems to be something about about the people who get into the selection process. And there's probably many people who don't get through the selection who also have traumatic childhoods and mm-hmm. adverse childhoods. Part of it is we probably also have to acknowledge it's more common than we... That's a fair point as well. ...than we give it credit for. Yeah, probably underreported. Yeah. But I, so, I, you know, I think like you, I know so many who, so many guys who have just like, you're just like, it just, it's shocking, you know, yeah. incest, uh, sexual molestation from like the age of, you know, six on, uh, physical abuse. Sometimes it's just neglect. Sometimes a lot of missing fathers, a lot of missing, uh, fathers in the picture. Yeah. I, yeah. I wonder, you know, the job in and of itself, especially in the wartime is not, uh, it's not peaceful. Mm-mm. You know, you're not training for peace and, and quite frankly, you're not really hoping for peace. Right. You know, young mm-hmm. soldiers want to be tested, and then they find themselves crossing that line. Like, oh, this sucks a little bit more than I thought I was going to. Yeah, but it builds yeah. up, and I I wonder if that upbringing you have that outlet, but then that outlet is gone at some point. You know, it has an expiration date, and then what are you left with? So what are you left with? Yeah, right. And I think I think for many guys, um, like you said, it wasn't talked about in the team room. So you, I don't think it was avoided. I, I honestly think it was just a topic we didn't even think to discuss. Right, right. It just wasn't relevant. It, that's in the past, rearview yeah. mirror, and now we're going forward and we're doing things. And we're doing exciting, meaningful, important, violent, dangerous, challenging things. And we're focused on that. So why talk about your childhood? Yeah. And then you get out of the service. And, and I mean, I think there's a, you know, you come to that full stop of the career, uh, and I mean, the transition itself is hard and we can get into that. Um, but there's so many other things that, that happen at that point. Um, you're, um, when do you stop to grieve the loss of your friends and your comrades and your brothers during your active career? Yeah, it depends on where you are in your cycle and how much time you may even have allotted. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of guys have a lot of time after they retire. Or well, you have nothing but time comparatively. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have it, what seems like right. no, no time at all in the middle of that churn, mm. and then afterwards, yeah, you have the rest of your life to deal with yeah. that time period. Yeah. Right. So suddenly, boom, you're out. Now you're. Now what are you? I yeah. want. I want to include responders in our conversation, Andy. Um, they're different. You know, first responders, firefighters, law enforcement. Uh, but they have a lot of the same kinds of things. And so, you know, the operator syndrome, the way I use it, the way others have been using it as a framework for, mm-hmm. for thinking about, you know, the stack of injuries and the stack of issues that, that either are injuries or can become injuries if they're not managed and mitigated early in a career, which is usually impossible, by the way, of course, for, for, for many. Um, but responders have their own, you know, similarities that I would I haven't studied it. In fact, nobody has, really. Hmm. But I, but I th- I would I would predict that you would see a very similar phenomena that ambition of shame in responders. That wouldn't surprise me. And I actually think that their role is harder. I had you know we knew when deployment windows were coming, which is kind of like a hey we're going to clock in, clock out. Right. I also wasn't operating where I live. And I wasn't dealing amongst the people that I might run into on a day-to-day basis. And then living in that community and society as well. And for every first responder or law enforcement person that I know, that bubble, yeah, maybe they work, you know, 72 on, 48 off. They're always on. If something happens in front of them, they're going to respond. They're going to respond, right. A hundred percent of the time. The, The police officers that I know, it's... Yeah, they take their badge off, I guess, their duty shirt and probably put it on their belt and their duty weapon becomes their, you know, the weapon that they're carrying around. And Mm -hmm. if something is happening in front of them, yes, they're going to be involved. And they also see the 
underbelly of where they live and still live amongst that. That's right. I didn't have to deal with that in Iraq or Afghanistan. I had, you know, 15 hour flights to drink as much as possible and play ambient roulette, which is not a game that I recommend for people, but it gets a little wild. Ambient. <laughs> What's the craziest thing you ever did on Ambient? Well, sometimes it becomes hard to remember what you're doing on Ambien. Well, exactly. Um, I think the most I ever consumed at one time was four and a half, uh, which took me a while to get to that point. And uh, I remember stumbling around a little bit and fell asleep not on my bed, but felt like I slept well. Mm -hmm. I've seen people completely passed out nude, face down in gravel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean... I, I've known guys that... Uh shaved their beard off in the middle of the night, woke up the next morning and, you know, got, That's a little, what I'm talking about. got a little startled when they looked in the mirror, Yeah, cooked a dinner. I'm not claiming to be a normal person by standard metrics or the people that I worked with. We, yeah, things that we thought were funny, other people would not. What? Things that we would be willing to do, other people would not. <laughs> it's called, it's a black sense of humor. I actually think it helped deal Absolutely. with a lot of the bullshit. And the horror. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how much of that stuff you can stuff down and stuff down and stuff down. And whether it be an unhealthy mechanism to deal with it or a healthy one, at least there was some attempt to probably deal with it. Yeah. Just to take it back to, I, di I diverged us. So the back VA. To, back to the, well, Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. I'll, remi I'll remember that one. You go where you were thinking. Okay, no, I just was going to have one point I wanted to make about responders, just to add to what you were, the points you were making. Not only are you in your own hometown where you live, and you see that dark underbelly, uh, and you know what's really going on, and you can't turn it off. That's right. You go to a restaurant with your with your family. You go to a, you go to the store, and you have that same hypervigilance you do when you're on duty. So you're looking around, you're, you're assessing people, you're going to guess, not guess, you're going to guesstimate who is that guy, who is that lady, what's going on over there, is that child okay? And, and then you go home at the end of the shift, that's another piece. I mean, like you just said, you had a 16-hour a ambient flight home. Responders have a, you know, Commute. They drive home. Yeah, it might be five minutes. Yeah, it might be five minutes. And then they're at home, and they got all that going on. And, hey, honey, how's your day? And then there's, you know, how do you not, uh, I don't know how they don't uh, bring it into their family every day. And, and of course, they do many, many, many times. It's yeah. impossible not to. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard in terms of managing that shift uh, uh uh, SEAL team spouse, Tanya Bowden, has talked about this, that it's uh, really important to change your uniform before you go home. Hmm. Take it off. Put on, put on civilian clothing, whether you're a responder, a soldier, whatever. Take it off. A physical distinction. A physical distinction, yeah. Because you're changing your identity that way. And so when you walk, see that. You walk in the door at home, and, I mean, and this, this, this holds true for soldiers who are, you know, stateside and, and not on deployment. They, they may be wearing um, work clothing. Uh, How are you going to get your free meal at Applebee's, though? <laughs> I mean, uh, how are you going to get thanked for your service? Yeah, thank, getting thanked for your service. <laughs> that's what it's really all about. <laughs> there are some people who wear those things because they want that. Yeah. I think it's an anomaly, and I don't want to mm -hmm. paint the norm with that, mm -hmm. but it's also real. Mm -hmm. Do team guys do that? You would be hard pressed to find somebody who didn't break out in hives wearing a uniform wow. as a SEAL, or probably any member of special any operations. Any special operations, yeah. yeah. That that would be my thought. There's something in the detergent, you know. It just it itched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now you're clean shaven. Yeah. What? Where's the beard? I couldn't grow a beard if you put a million dollars on this table. We had a podcast yesterday. I was telling him I could invade like Amish and go undercover churning butter. That's like all I could do. Mm. And also the beard, like it's a low viz, like it's supposed to buy you a little bit of time. Right. When I did have my like habish beard and I looked like I had ridden overseas on a horse drawn wagon, I'm I'm not buying any more time. I'm getting more scrutiny from these people looking at me like, you look nothing like us. So I might as well have worn a Santa outfit. Hmm. But don't they have, okay, yeah. 
Don't they have what? I'll skip Fake that beards? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I stopped myself before I said it. Yeah. All right. Back to the VA. So do you use the VA? I have never sought treatment from the VA. Okay. I also don't live in an area that has a huge VA outlet or ability to do right, so. Right. The only time I touched the VA is when I was in the medical retirement process. You get your VA rating. Um, and so when the PEB determines whether or not you're going to be medically retired from the military, you get your rating. So you do the VA meetings, uh, all of the appointments that you go to. Yep. That has been my only interaction with the VA system. How'd that go? It was very cookie cutter. I mean, the meetings were designated as a rating meeting. They were separate. And like you do like a hearing test, right? It's like the hearing test is going to be the hearing test. Um, you know, you go talk to the, I don't know if it was a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but they have a screening for post-traumatic stress. You know, like an era physician to look at any underlying, do you have joint issues, you know, a history, if you need to get tests done. It was very cookie cutter yeah. and very clinical. I think the longest one of the meetings was maybe, I mean, this was years ago, maybe 30 minutes. So, And you're a clinician. I mean, yeah. you, you let me know what you could really pull from somebody right. in 30 minutes. So for Off a, of templative questions yeah. that they were clearly reading. Yeah. Not, it, not, it's not like they were really, and it, 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 I don't know if it was even designed to do that, yeah. but there was no attempt at like yeah. a real interaction other than, do you have nightmares? Stuff like that. So I could give you, uh, you know, the the there's a one one page questionnaire, the PCL, uh, post traumatic stress disorder checklist, mm -hmm. and I could give you that, and you could complete it in about three minutes, and I could score it in about ten seconds. Boom. Then I have a score, a severity score. What's that score worth, though? Ah, uh, <laughs> nothing. I was going to say, you might have a score, but to what end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me let me correct myself. It's not worth nothing, but without context, yeah. it's worth nothing. And so um, my approach, I typically, and I do, I do some evaluations, not for the VA, uh, some private evaluations. It's typically a four-hour process, maybe spread over three or four meetings over the course of a, you know, 10 to day, seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something very valuable about... Hey, we've talked for an hour. We take a break for a couple of days. We come back and and um, you've thought of things. I've thought of things and we'll resume the conversation. So, okay. So when the VA did your, whatever this, this uh, checklist evaluation that they gave you, did you get a sleep study? I had a sleep study done at NICO. Okay. Oh, okay. So you went through NICO. Yes. Good. Okay. National Intrepid Center of Excellence, yes. which is a comprehensive brain health program at Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so presumably then, so you did have a sleep study mm -hmm. and presumably cause they do a whole sort of 360 evaluation there. And so that should have been in your records that the VA examiners would have had. If it was, they made no mention of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I just said they would have had, what I should yeah. have said is they should have had, and if they had it, then it's a question of, did anybody even look at it? I don't know. You know, some of the questions I found my personal thought process going into that all of the meetings was I was just going to be completely honest with them regardless you know it's like who am I to rate myself how about we rely on the people who right. are actually trained yeah. and study and mm -hmm. practice this mm -hmm. and specifically you know when it comes to post-traumatic stress you know, one of the questions I remember was the guy said are you haunted by things that you either did or witnessed overseas and I said well what do you mean by haunted and he said do you think of things often that you did or experienced overseas? I said, yes. He didn't ask me a follow-up hmm. because if he would have, I would have said probably half of the time, it's hilarious stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe another half of that would be positive things, um, not even kinetically related, but just memories of people. And occasionally, yeah, your thoughts will drift back to experiences or exposures, but it was just such an incomplete question. Yeah. That what did, could possibly be gained by my answer? Well, there's the problem with all of psychiatric disorders. To take one question or a series of questions out of context is relatively worthless. It did get us out of there in about 30 minutes, though. Yeah. It was right before lunch. 
and when <laughs> and when it was all over and said and done with, and you got your your rating letter from the VA, did you look at it and go, okay, yeah, that's fair, it's good? I don't agree with the rating that they gave me. How so? The post traumatic stress rating. Okay, they put me down as moderate. Okay, and I don't know what that means. So are you severe? I don't know. Okay, I am the most normal person that I know. Yeah, and I pay Michael to say that too. But you're a legend in your own mind. Oh no. A legend of, like, fucking things up. Okay. Not like a legend of, like, this is the tale of when I was successful. No, I, I've i determined that I'm at where I'm at in my life because I'm fortunate enough to trip forward instead of falling backwards. <laughs> it's a it's a long, it's a long journey, yeah. but... <laughs> That's a good way to do it. <laughs> forward progress. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to remember that next yeah. time I'm tripping. Go go forward. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're all going to trip. I think so, it's a matter of... So the moderate PTSD rating, like, what was your... What's the... Why do you disagree with it? I feel like a better person because of my experiences, not a damage or worse. Okay. And I don't think – I hate the D. on I hate the disorder aspect, mm-hmm. aspect of post-traumatic stress. I don't think that being changed by your experiences in war should be abnormal. Great. I think it should be expected. Yes. If the if – the, I understand the disorder – I mean the human beings, if we were not designed to deal with trauma, how would we have ever survived the first saber-toothed tiger pulling somebody away yes. from a fire, right? Exactly. If they never resolve themselves and you never get better, then I understand mm. that that's a disorder. Mm. But I truly feel like a better version of myself because of the experiences that I went through. And I answered their questions honestly. And yes, I think about things that happened every single day. Do I dream about mm. them sometimes? Yes, I do. But they don't haunt me. Mm. They don't hinder me from being who mm-hmm. I want to be. Mm-hmm. If anything, they remind me why. I need to work so hard Mm -hmm. to be what I want Mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so there's so many problems, you know, with this issue that we've just kind of outlined here. Do you think your PTSD should should have been rated mild? I don't know. I don't know if I have any. Any PTSD. Okay. For clarity, I don't remember who I was at 18, right? Like I struggle in the rear view mirror to really, who how does? well do you know yourself? Who does? Exactly. Yeah, who does? So like at what are we rating the scale against? Yeah. Does this yeah. calculator begin at 25 yeah. when their prefrontal cortex is supposed to be formed? Mm-hmm. Is it only the last, you know what I mean? Like I don't, yeah. It. what am I rating myself against? Yeah. Well, so PTSD is it's an interesting diagnosis. It was never formally uh, a disorder in the psychiatric nomenclature until 1980. So it was hmm. added in 1980. Um, it was the third edition of the diagnostic, the DSM, which is the American Psychiatric Association's, you know, book of here's what the psychiatric disorders are and here's how we define them. And it really came about, um, I believe, and many others do, that it was a, a process in the 1970s of Vietnam era veterans coming home or Vietnam veterans coming home, having problems or being perceived as having problems. And you had a, a you know, the, the psychiatry establishment at that time, probably the psychology establishment at that time was, was very much anti-Vietnam War. At the same time in, the, in that decade, you had a, an advocacy uh, movement that was partly scientifically based and well-intentioned that was concerned that females who were victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, childhood sexual abuse, physical abuse, all of that, that, that they were not being recognized and treated and understood. So the idea of creating a diagnosis was a way of basically kind of creating a, you know, a, a symbol, a statue to you have lived through and survived these horrible things and we're going to recognize that we're hearing you and we want to, you know, it, it's a way of, if you don't have a disorder, you don't have a way of defining um, what kind of services people need and get. You don't have a way of, of articulating policies, including disability policies. Mm -hmm. So, um, the research that led into the in the 1970s, I mean, they did study it. There were re, there was research, but it was more than anything. It was an advocacy movement hmm. that brought this in. My opinion here, others share that opinion. If you if you really parse 
PTSD, if you just kind of take the list of the 20 symptoms and you circle every symptom that is related to depression and every symptom that's related to general anxiety, you've pretty much circled all 20 items. There are specifics. The, the, um, the intrusive thoughts that you are being asked about, which are supposed to be unwanted, bothersome, anxiety provoking. We, we've kind of all forgotten about that. That usually never gets pulled into the question. Certainly was not framed that way to me. Right. Um, because they, they only had 30 minutes and minutes and lunch was waiting. I swear we had an hour. I'm just saying we got out of there in 30. <laughs> I'm not going to try to yeah. estimate yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could have been lunch. Could have been lunch. Who knows? So, so we created a diagnosis, I think, you know, so that we had some, a foundation that we could build things onto and around. Um, we didn't just say, you know what, people who have been to war, people who have been victim, victims of sexual or domestic violence, they have depression and anxiety as a result of this, and we should take care of them or help take care of them and do the research that that, that requires. We created a new diagnosis for that. And we're now in the, th the fifth edition of the DSM, and we've modified the criteria each at the fourth edition and again at the fifth edition, usually adding new symptoms. Um, I don't think we fundamentally changed what it is. I don't think most people would, would you know, I, don't, I think most clinicians would agree it's not really fundamentally a different disorder now than it was in 1980. And we do have a lot of research on it since then, and I've done much of that research, and I've had grants and published and, and such. So I'm not saying it's not a disorder. I'm not saying saying that. Mm. But we've we've kind of given it a, a spirit, so to speak. Another piece about PTSD that people don't know widely, unless they're taking one of my classes or, you know, maybe studying it is the DSM is agnostic. The DSM is the diagnostic statistical book that psychiatry, mm -hmm. is, psychi psychiatry and psychology use. It's agnostic as to the cause of every psychiatric illness, except the trauma disorders which is hmm. PTSD and acute stress disorder, essentially. It's interesting. So PTSD requires an index event. That's what they call it, an index event. You have to be able to say, this was my traumatic experience, and define it, and, and boom, there it is. If you have that, then you can have PTSD. If you don't have that, you can't have PTSD. Hmm. You can have depression. You can have anxiety. Um, there's studies that have been done, that, like with people who have have experienced other stressful events, like divorce. Their scores on that PCL checklist that I referenced a few minutes ago come out looking exactly the same. You know, high elevations, high scores. People with you know officially defined traumas. I would agree with that. I yeah. haven't experienced one. Yeah, I yeah. would have circled a lot of the same bubbles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it doesn't really count as a trauma. Divorce. Walk a mile in somebody's shoes and you might disagree <laughs> with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then the question is, is what is a trauma? How do we define it? Oh. How, how do we mark it? And it used to be defined as an event that was outside the range of normal human experience. This is 1980. And included a response at the time of fear, helplessness, or horror. Hmm. Okay. Now, part of the problem we would have, what we have for operators is, what's the index event? Yeah, where do you want to begin? Where do you begin? <laughs> right? Is there one thing? No. The first time I thought I was going to drown in training? I yeah. Mean, it's yeah. like, where do you want to start with right. that? Right. Day, you know, day one of BUDS. Uh, so that's a huge part of our problem. And we've expanded that, that definition. We dropped the fear, helplessness, or horror. I think we dropped that at DSM-4. Um, and, of course, people use the phrase trauma now to apply to anything. You know, my dog died. That's traumatic. I mean, hard, painful, a loss, for yeah. sure. Yeah, but if it applies to everything, the value of that word just decreases. It applies to everything, then it applies to nothing. Yeah. And um, so we've trivialized trauma now, I think. And everybody's traumatic, traumatized. College students describe being a college student as traumatic. Um, that's a whole other conversation. Like just experiencing college? Mm -hmm. 
Some do. I don't know where to go with that, if well, that's your baseline for trauma. Well, let me give you this one. So one of the things that uh, in, in college is stressful. Yeah. And I think it's more stressful. It's stressful and traumatic are two, two very different very things. different things, yes. Um, and I, you know, I, teach, I'm a, I teach undergraduate courses, and I've been doing that since for, for quite a while now. I used to be in medical schools, but the, the last uh, decade or so, my work, my teaching has all been at the, the University of Hawaii with undergraduate students mostly. Um, it is stressful, and it is hard. It's probably much harder today than it was when I went to college in 1981. There's more choices to make. Everything is more complicated. I look at the graduation requirements now, and it's just like, can you make sense of them? It's really complicated. Yeah. I just had to go and take a bunch of classes and make sure I got an English class and a, and a you know, a couple other required classes. Um, kids today have been most most college students today have been raised differently uh, than I was raised. Um, so they get to college, and many of them aren't ready to be there intellectually, cognitively, or socially, especially socially, I think. Um, social media has just added an, a massive vector of, of pain and, and, and confusion. It's the worst. Uh, yeah. I am really thankful I didn't grow up with that. Me too. I don't know what to call it. Tool, satanic device. I don't, <laughs> it depends on uh, brain, where you land. Brainwashing, propaganda. Yeah. Um, back to the VA. My mind kind of bounces around uh, sometimes. So, so the thing with PTSD, and let's let's now for our conversation say it is a real disorder because people who meet criteria have, in my opinion, at least depression and anxiety that, that I would agree that is that yep. is bothering them, and they should receive treatment. And every soldier should receive the medical care they need. Uh, I do. N people said, "Oh, you deny that veterans have problems." I do not deny that veterans have problems. They, anybody who put on a uniform and has any difficulties as a result, or even if they don't have difficulties directly stemming from their military service, their country owes them a, a debt of gratitude and the responsibility that we, that we serve them and take care of them is to the extent that they need. I completely agree. But PTSD is, uh, and I'm just going to call it PTSD going forward here without, you know, questioning all the definitional aspects of it. But, um... It's treatable. We have good treatments for it. On the civilian side, where there is no disability routinely available to civilians with PTSD, people go for treatment. They live their lives. They either they get over, they, 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 they um, go into remission from PTSD for the most part, they get, or they get entirely cured, or they get helped extensively, and, and maybe they still have mild PTSD. So does it make sense uh, to, to for the, as a VA policy, does it make sense to give permanent, you know, lifetime disability to somebody with a disorder that we could treat? A disorder that's essentially, you know, depression and anxiety. Does that make sense? Is that logical? I think most of the time when people get – I know you can get 100 percent disability based off of just PTSD. A lot of the time it's a combination of that nets correct. you that. Yeah. Correct, correct. But, I, but, I think the biggest issue with the VA is the money. It is a system where if they were to modify your rating down, people would get less. And I've seen studies where they show – like you're saying, it's treatable. The improvement in out of military society where the length of time and the treatment and how the it is decreasing. And then it shows the curve of the military and it doesn't decrease. That's right. That's exactly right. They financially tie That's right. your rating to how much money you get. I don't know a lot of people that are like, Chris, I need you to pay me less. <laughs> it's just <laughs> well, well, first of all, I know guys that have tried to ask for their rating to be reduced. Small number. Yeah. You know, very small number. The larger number is on the other side of that. And a very dirty, dark secret that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And I have seen these firsthand. Are entire portals and pages of people coaching others into what to say. Yep. How to behave. Yep. How to make your appearance at one of these with the yep. entire goal 
of getting to 100% permanent yep. and total. Yep. Yep. I have two. And there's a long story there that we can talk about. The um, Wounding Warriors is a book. Wounding Warriors, How VA Policies Makes Veterans Sicker and Poor is, is a book. You should have uh, maybe consider getting Dan Gate up here to okay. talk with him. So let's just start with the policy. It's probably a very well-meaning policy at the time it was created, like many policies, mm -hmm. federal policies. But we created an, an incentive not only to be sick, but to stay sick. So, so we could treat your PTSD. <coughs> Excuse me. But if we are also paying you money to have PTSD, how, are you, how can we expect you to get better? What kind of message are we sending you? Hey, you have this disorder. We're going to, we're going to, whatever your rating is 10%, 30%, 100%, you're going to get it forever. Because we don't expect you to get ever get better. Yeah, that's what a message does that send? Yeah, that's the message. And then if you you look at the VA's um, treatment success, I mean, how much money does the VA spend on mental health care as a system? Bill, no clue. Billion. Michael, can you look that up? Billions. How much money was spent? How much money does the VA spend on mental health care? The number is going to be large. It's going to be large. And where is there evidence that anybody benefits from their treatment? There isn't. They that is a fair question. They don't show it. If they have it, they don't show it. Oh, shit. $13.9 billion. I was going to guess one or two billion. This is a 14% wow. okay. increase from 2022. Yeah. And nobody's getting better. It also, yeah, and it includes $139 million for VA research programs and $16.6 billion for VA medical care program. Mm -hmm. That's a large number. And nobody's getting better. And a 14% increase in one year? Yeah. This is not about taking care of veterans. This is about growing the size of the U.S. government, the federal government. And making, making people reliant upon it. Yep. How many, how many psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers nurses and other people work in the VA's mental health system. Every single one of them becomes a lifetime, you, you know, a federal worker. Yeah, GS pay scale. GS pay scale. They're a federal worker. They can't be fired. There's very little accountability. And and uh, you could wonder what's the real point of that, given that veterans aren't getting better. And then if you really go in and look at what's happening in the VA right now, and I'm not in the VA. I need to sit, I need to correct this. I worked. I was a VA psychologist myself from 1991 as a trainee, and then 92 to 2006. So a pretty good block of time. I left just as the global war on terror veterans were starting to come into the VA yeah. system. Most of my most of my career was was spent working with Vietnam veterans, along with uh, quite a few Korean War, a few uh, a few um, World War II veterans, and even a few. Persian Gulf, uh, Gulf War One veterans, um, and I lo I liked my my patients. I loved working with them. I enjoyed being a part of the VA, except for the system part of things. Um, but why why would we build a, a fourteen billion dollar mental health care services nationwide, and nobody's getting better from it? I don't have a good answer for that. There's another piece here. Who does the research? Oh, for the 139 million? Well, no, no, for veterans. Who does the research on veterans? I have no idea. Nobody does. But I, well, few people do, but I'll tell you. It's the VA. The VA has a very large research program. They fund federally funded research grants that are competitive. When I was a VA employee... Um, I had NIH grants, National Institute of Health research grants, which are even more competitive. Uh, and I also had VA grants. Um, here's the interesting thing, though. The VA holds a monopoly on their research. Anybody in America who's, you know, you have to be, have a credible scientific, you know, approach, but anybody in America can apply for a National Institute of Health grant and is, really? el and is eligible to apply. I mean, it helps if you're actually a scientist, and it helps if you are part of a university. Those are, you know, pretty big. I feel like some slide through the cracks. A few do. Well, 
yeah, I mean, one could wonder what, what some of these advanced degrees really are all about. But it's an open competition at the NIH. At the VA, it's not an open competition. Only VA employees can apply for VA dollars. The day I left the VA, I was no longer eligible to apply for VA research grants. I feel like that's a very dangerous system that could easily turn into an echo chamber. 100%. And then you have to remember that, so the VA is, it's an internal club. They cultivate their own from within. I, it was made very clear to me by many people, um, friends oftentimes, hey, you know, stop, don't do that research because the VA doesn't want to, doesn't, isn't going to appreciate that. And I would say, but, but it matters. Well, that doesn't matter. The VA doesn't want it. So everybody figures out, everybody who's a VA employee who's applying for research grants, they know what's going to get funded and what's not. They know there's a party line. And that party line is very much don't question, you know, don't question why we have no data showing that veterans get better. I mean, there are some small studies, mm -hmm. you know, randomized controlled trials that, that some scientists have done showing that veterans get better. In those studies, the best, the best study uh, that was published in JAMA probably 20 years ago, but it was done with female, not combatants, it was done with female uh, sexual assault. Uh, survivors, um, and they showed some pretty promising results, but um, it's not an open competition, and I can't apply for it. I have over 300 scientific publications. I'm considered to be a so-called expert. Um, I get a little email a couple times a year telling me, congratulating me from some somebody that tracks these things that objectively my research puts me into the 99.99% .99 of all PTSD researchers, but I am not eligible to apply for VA because research. Because you don't work for the VA. Because I don't work for them. Hmm. And then you think about the pressure that's on younger investigators who work for the VA. They have a mentor above them. They have a senior person that they have to respond to. Their mentor is somebody who's been in the system, knows how the system works, knows what the politics work. And they're, they've been, you know, there's a, I don't want to say there's a party line, but there's something of a narrative that everybody follows. And the people who chafe at that leave the VA. I left the VA. <coughs> so the VA has a monopoly on the research uh, that, that, that's done. I could get an NIH grant to study veterans, but I couldn't collect any data inside the VA because I'm not a VA employee. So people who are not in the VA, if they have a grant, it's, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen. We have, my colleague, my colleagues and I, Debbie Beidle at the University of Central Florida, have had grants to study veterans um, uh, treatment of PTSD, but it, it's hard to get the research subjects outside of the VA. The VA won't allow you to come in and do it. It's typically. a very interesting walled garden approach. It is. The other thing that we get in our in our studies, uh, and we always have uh, seen this. I saw this when I worked in the VA. I've seen it since I left the VA. Is you get the you get the, your research subjects who are in the treatment program, and at the end of it, somewhere towards the end, they're saying, ah, "I'm doing much better. I feel you know this really helped. Thank you." Please don't write that down anywhere that the VA will see it because I don't want to risk losing my disability. Yeah. Now, you brought up the malingering, um, the gaming of the system. That's probably a better way to put it. Malingering is a great term, though. Malingering is a good term. <laughs> Symptom over. Sometimes people are malingering. Sometimes there is a, yeah, that's probably a small, small group. There are people that game the system. And there are people who have problems that aren't PTSD, but that's where you got to take your problem in order to, to get that disability payment. Um. My, some of my early research in the 1990s, I was looking at things like malingering and symptom over-reporting. The, the data on that are really clear. Um, I, I even stopped, kind of stopped doing that research by the year 2000 because if you, if you gave, you know, it was just like, what are you going to do with that? Everybody is exaggerating. I mean, not everybody, but very 50, 70% are, are um, exaggerating their symptoms. 
we did a, we uh, completed a study. It was published in 05, 2005, in the British Journal of Psychiatry. And we had, I think we'd started it in 04, probably. And I worked with Jug Burkett, who um, wrote a book titled Stolen Valor. You may have heard of the Stolen Valor Act, the idea that people... I know what it is. Yeah, and I believe they codified that into law, right? It is a law, yeah. right. Um, it's a, I think it's now like a misdemeanor. Initially, it was going to be a, a more serious crime. Burkett wrote a book that was published in the late 90s, where essentially what he did was he just watched all the veteran. He was a Vietnam veteran himself, and he just saw all these examples of Vietnam veterans in the news, in the public eye, you know, kind of leveraging their veteran status uh, to, to get elected to office, to get a job, to, you know, some of them were get, just getting attention. And just one by one, he started doing Freedom of Information Act requests. He got their DD-214s, their military record from the St. Louis Personnel um, Department, and they and, and he wrote a whole book on this concept of stolen valor, that this was a, a very a common thing, that people lied about their actual military service, never mind the symptoms that they described, never mind how they, you know, what their symptoms were. They lied about the nature of their service itself. Many of them weren't veterans at all. It's surprising actually how common it is. And it blows my mind because access to information is not that difficult. So to no. do that as a public facing person, I just, I wonder what they think of at night as they're drifting off to sleep. <laughs> Well, most of them get away with it. Up to a point, though. I mean, there's plenty of examples where it comes catastrophically down. Yes. Yeah. I just don't know how you go to sleep at night. Yeah. Well, that gets do back you, to... Do that you end up believing your own lie? Is that how they... If, like, if that becomes your persona in life, do they actually end up yeah. believing it? Or yeah. do they know they're a fucking liar? Yeah. <laughs> You're the professional. Uh, I can't answer that question. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well. so we took a look at the VA, um, and we didn't have any money to do this, so we, we kind of did a, a relatively small study, f thinking naively that if we found a signal, that, that we could then do a larger study, or other people would do a larger study. So I worked with Burkett, uh, became friends with him, and, and he advised us on, our, on a project where we, we did a Freedom of Information Act request for 100 consecutive patients coming into our clinic, our PTSD clinic, uh, representing as Vietnam veterans. Not era, but actually deployed mm -hmm. uh, veterans. And we got these hundred, you know, we sent away and we, you know, a hundred um, got, we requested the DD-214 for each one. And it was shocking how many lies we heard. We matched it up to what they told us on the clinical interviews um, and I don't, off the top of my head, I mean, this was, this was a long, almost 20 years ago now, or 20 years ago, so I don't remember the numbers, but we found a couple, you know, there, were, there was one or two individuals who had never even served. There was a handful of people who had served but never deployed to Vietnam. There was a very large number of people who had deployed, but not in a combat role. Not in, I mean, it was a very high number of people who mm -hmm. had deployed, but not in a combat role, which is what, that's most people who deploy, that's right? That's the design of the military. Exactly. It's Yeah, direct combat arms is maybe 15% of the military, exactly. if not less. That's right. Exactly. But, uh, so, that was, it was, it was eye-opening. It was shocking how many people grossly misrepresented. And I'm not talking about, oh, you know, it could have been, you know, gray, you know, gray line area. We had a handful of people telling us they were SEALs or um, Green Berets. Um, I had a guy tell me once he served with SEAL Team 3 in Before Vietnam. there was a SEAL Team 3. Yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> uh, he, how do I keep this broad? He delivered something to the house. I did not mention anything SEAL related. He could not wait to tell me that he was a SEAL, obviously unaware of my own background. And so I, I know oh. the right buying questions right. to ask. I'm like, right. dude, that's that's what I always start. I'm like, dude, that's so awesome. That's awesome. I've always wanted to meet one of you guys because I always wanted to be one. What team were you with? Like, SEAL Team 3. I'm like, that's amazing. Oh. When were you, when did you serve? Uh, Vietnam in the 70s. In the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, okay. SEAL Team 3 got commissioned in 1980. I'm like, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to ask what when in the 70s because. Uh, At did. that point, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like can we end this interaction? I've, I've, right. It's not going to get any better. So what'd you do? Did you confront him? 
I told his boss. Did you? Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that I like. Because I, I knew his I, boss. His I boss like was that. a personal friend of mine. I like that. I was at the VA for what, 16 years. I never met a SEAL as a patient. I never met a Green Beret as a patient. Really? I, not one. I, not <laughs> one. I, let me correct myself. There were a number, two or three a year, who represented as such. Of course. But they weren't. And like you said, it's easy to know. It's easy to verify. If you come from that world, within a matter of two minutes, I can kind of separate the bullshit from the truth. Well, in fairness, you can. Yeah. But you're, you know, the kids who work in the VA now, you know, the 20, 30 year old therapists who don't know anything. Yeah, they don't know the questions to ask. They don't know the questions to ask. And there is this assumption, you know, that I think a lot of Americans have um, based on, you know, good intentions, but also ignorance is that every veteran's a hero. Every veteran was a combatant. Every veteran has PTSD. Every veteran, you know, is lucky to be alive because they just, you know, came a whisper, whisper close to you know, dying in, in combat. You know, you mentioned that the woke ideology is invading the VA. Who's to say that somebody who identifies as a SEAL wasn't actually a SEAL? We're going there. So, right, you know, I want You know to, what I mean? Like, are yeah. we even allowed to ask? I, how do you know I, I identify right now, actually, Chris, I identify as a Green Beret. That's so cool. Later, though, I might be a Ranger. Right. Perhaps I'll return to being a SEAL. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. How fucking far are we going to play this game? Well, I mean, if, if <laughs> it, right, exactly. If if we can, if if a boy isn't a boy and a girl isn't a girl, and anybody can be fluid and, and bouncing back and forth, yeah. How far does it go? Why can't I be sixty five and get social security? I identify as eighty. I, hmm. want, I want my entire social security benefit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what's going on? So, here? so here's some things. I have a I have a friend who was who was a Marine Raider, who went on and got a. Clinical. Actual or identified as? Actual. We're going to need to be clear for the rest of the podcast. Actual. An actual, <laughs> real, real deer. Yeah, he's a badass MF. And can we swear on your show? Does this... this is the internet. We can say whatever we want. Fuck yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he got his uh, doctorate in clinical psychology recently and started a, uh, his first job at the VA a few months ago. And like his head has exploded practically. He has, he surround, first of all, he's surrounded by people who, um, other clinicians um, who don't know anything about combat, don't know anything about the history of the war, don't know anything about the culture of any military branch or, or MOS. He is shocked by what they want to do. They want to set up groups for LGBTQ support which I'm not opposed to that, but why is that the fundamental primary thing that many people would want to do as a clinician coming into the VA? Hmm. The, oh. the VA has announced um, initiatives. Well, they've announced policies that any veteran who doesn't use proper pronoun, doesn't use the, re not proper, what's the, what's the phrase? Preferred. Preferred, thank you. Preferred pronouns that that veteran is, you know, the policy says that veteran then can be disallowed from coming to the VA. So if you were to so go... compelling speech. Yes, absolutely. Well, this is happening everywhere in America. So why, of course, it's happening in a large federal bureaucracy. Okay, yep. If you go, I went to the website of the National Centers for PTSD recently, and there was uh, like right the big thing that was the main thing that I saw to the page that I landed on was all the work they're doing on racial trauma. Which again, I, I didn't read it. I didn't really go deep into it, but, um, and not that I'm, I'm not uh, casting aspersions on that per se, but why is that the fundamental primary exciting thing that the VA's uh, national centers for PTSD are doing? I can't answer that. Nor can I. I want to go back um, to the study we did on the, Freedom of Information Act request, the study I did with Jug Burkett, because we had a really interesting story that, that came from that, that, that kind of cemented in my mind that I needed to leave the VA. We submitted the journal, the paper, we wrote the paper, completed the study, submitted the paper to the American Journal of Psychiatry, who pretty quickly rejected it. And, you know, usually when you, 
when you submit a paper and they send it out for review, you get the reviews back. The reviewers, it's all, that's how science works. It's peer reviewers. They give you their notes and, or they give, thought, yeah. they give you a, they, it's a write up, okay. um, a critique, um, which is a, a flow and exchange of information. Yeah. It's I a, like this. It's the quality control of science. Yeah. It, it often works really, really well. Uh, you know, we've all, all, all scientists have been peer reviewers. Uh, you have peer review on the, the institutional review boards that, protect human subjects. You have peer reviewers at, for grants. You have peer reviewers at journals. And it's volunteer. None of this is paid work. It's just stuff you're supposed to do. So we got one review back, and it was about three sentences long. Usually, sometimes these reviews are pages. And the review was, uh, this paper can't possibly, you know, these results can't possibly be true. Because if they are, it, you know, destroy, you know, it upends everything the VA is doing. Which is the value of the study to begin with. Yes. So they didn't accept it. Uh, right around that time, I got a phone call from a man who's my mentor, officially my mentor on an NIH grant. It was a career development grant where you have, you know, it pays you to be mentored. And he called me and he said, hey, hi, Chris, I'm, I'm calling you from the undersecretary of the VA's office here in D.C. And we've got the congressional budget hearings tomorrow. And I'm looking at this paper you submitted to the American Journal of Psychiatry. I'm like, what? How'd you get that? You're not supposed to, these are supposed to be confidential. These aren't just things that get mm -hmm. leaked out. And he said, well, a lot of people are upset by this, and you can't publish this. You can't submit this anywhere else. You need to just deep six this. And, and, and I was like, well, dude, why? Why? What are you talking about? I'm a scientist. I, you know, the data are what the data are, and I, f I have to follow that data and respect it. His, he was like, well, this, this would be embarrassing to a lot of people, and if this gets to Congress, if this gets in front of Congress, it threatens the budget of the VA, uh, that $14 billion that we— And that's only for mental health care. And that's only for, for— Michael, what is the overall budget of the VA? Let's blow our fucking minds. Well, and, and I mean, I really want to keep my remarks focused on the mental health yeah, part. I'm just fascinated on the overall. Because the VA does a lot of good health care for... $325 billion. $400 billion. Oh, three... Uh, uh, actually, requested $325 billion in fiscal year 2024, which is a 5.4% increase from 2023. Okay. And that, that includes, you know, amputation care, primary care. It's a lot. A lot of things, yeah, for of course. Sure. Um, I was so, just curious where that budget for mental health fell inside of the, how big of that slice was yeah, in comparison to yeah. the pie. So, so my mentor, who is a director of one of the, P, the VA's national centers for PTSD, meaning he's one of the top people, not just in the VA, but in the entire field. Um, he's calling me and he's telling, telling me I need to, you know, pull this paper and not publish it. And he's telling me, well, these results can't be true. Um, they're they're going to cause problems. Congress is going to question this. We can't afford to have our budgets, you know, threatened. And he also said, this is going to be the end of your research career if you publish this. I mean, he was, he was coaxing me and he was also threatening me. He was bullying me. Um, and this is a, this was, a, is a, is a man who's very, you know, very senior, very well known in the field. And okay. He told me, uh, he said he 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 tried to reassure me. Trust me, we've looked, we've we've done all the due diligence. We know from these other from the, like the Vietnam Veterans Readjustment Study that there is no nobody's deceiving anybody about their experiences. It's like wow, so veterans don't lie, and humans don't <clears throat> lie. Okay, and he said. Plus, it's just a small study; it's only a hundred subjects. And I said, agreed. It's only a hundred subjects, but it's such a large effect. Why wouldn't people want to know about this? Why would the VA not, not like be concerned about this? They should be concerned. Now, you know, you can go, well, well, hmm. why would the VA not care? Well, everybody who works in the VA is a bureaucrat by nature, essentially, federal employee. And how do bureaucrats, especially at the, tr at, at the top of organizations or units or agencies within the VA, they all want to grow their budget. So there's really no incentive for the VA to have to, to exercise any due diligence on their budget. Yeah, you know, as you're describing this, I don't know why, but my brain drifted over to thinking about lifting and shifting what you're describing to a for-profit organization like Ford. 
to you to pick an auto mm-hmm. manufacturer mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you know a lot of people don't start paying attention until there's a catastrophe but let's say maybe there was a whistleblower mm-hmm. and they were to find pressure and coercion and information that had been suppressed inside of Ford around a defective product, Mm -hmm. that would be front page news on every paper and in every media source in the United States, Mm -hmm. but not at the VA. Mm. So, (coughs) so this, just to continue this little uh, anecdote, the, we, so we submitted the paper to the British journal of psychiatry, which is a journal that, doesn't give a crap about the American VA or the people that work for the American VA. A bunch of cunts over there. I uh, love their mastery of the word. It's, yes. I, I yeah. meant that in a positive way. Bloody cunts. Of course. Bloody cunts. And they, um, it, not only did they publish it, but they published it with a, uh, a very beautiful commentary right next to it, discussing it and kind of critique, analyzing it and, and, praising it, but also saying, you know, there's a lot of importance to this study that, that we need to kind of extend and, and uh, you know, really dive into. And that was Simon Wesley who wrote that commentary. He was probably one of the reviewers that uh, on the paper. Simon is now Sir Simon because um, he was knighted a few years ago, decade ago for his work. So not a crack, not a, not a, I mean, a real, the real deal kind of guy. Um so it was published there, and it did get a lot of attention in the media. I was interviewed by BBC, Washington Post, uh, The Economist, um, Wall Street Journal has done many interviews with me over heavy hitters later, later years. Yeah, but the VA, they didn't do anything with it. In fact, uh, one evening about 7 o'clock, I received an email. This was probably a month or two later. received an email from my su- superior, my boss, the you know, the head of the mental health line at the VA, who was a co-author on the paper. And he said, uh, Chris, there's some a little bit of trouble here. Um, I need you to, you know, we need to address some questions that have come from VA central office in DC. And so he said, check your email and, uh, you know, get prepared because we have to meet at the director's office tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., Seven, you know, like twelve. You had twelve hours, mm-hmm. and what it was was a it was a list of questions, and the questions included things like, "Why did you do this study? Was it funded, and who funded it? Did you go through the proper, you know, review processes at the university? Um, did you go through the proper research and development uh, review process through the VA?" Um, and it was a there were a few other questions like that, and that I had to like write little written answers to each. And I show up at the at the meeting the next day at the at the director's office, and we had a conference call with some somebody in D.C. Uh, you know, it was it was a little bit interesting. Uh, I'm being investigated uh, with no charges, no accusations. Just hey, we, you know, we've got these questions about the study and what, what's going on, and you only have twelve. You know, you have overnight to prepare for this meeting at seven a.m. Now the R and D, the chief of R and D for the hospital. Um, who was amazing, showed up at that meeting and she had the file. So I barely said a word at the meeting. She she was like, yep, we got this, we got this. Mm-hmm. You know, every I dotted, every T crossed. And that was the end of it. Nothing further. No explanation, no apology, no... They were no, looking for a reason to attack the study as opposed to paying attention to the data. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they were doing. And in the process of getting these interviews, because, you know, the Washington Post wanted to talk to me and all these things, my hospital actually had to, in response to central office, they had to put the hospital's head of PR, basically became my handler. And so any interview I gave, she had to be there. I had to get permission in advance, written permission, which had to go up the chain. So it would take, you know, four or five days to get permission. If you know anything about journalists, which I, I think you do, you know if they want to talk to you, they want to talk to you now. Yeah. Yeah, today. They usually want to talk to you about something pertinent. Yeah, and it's usually like, hey, it's you know, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and do you have time you know, later this morning or this afternoon? So I'm, you know, we just simply missed some deadlines. Um, there were other interviews that I gave where she, she was like, jump in. Nope, you can't ask him that question. Or after some of the sometimes I would give an answer, it would be nope. You can't you know strike that response from the from your record. That that he's not allowed to 
respond to that or he's not allowed to say that kind of thing. Now, in fairness to her and the process, they they weren't stopping me from talking about the study itself, um, but it was it was a really narrow lane that they were allowing. I mean, withholding information and censorship has historically shown out to be really good. Yeah. Yeah. I left the VA shortly after that. I don't blame you. Yeah. What does it look like if the woke ideology does invade psychiatry and psychology? Well, it already has. What's the end state of that? You tell me. Well, I don't know anything about either, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, so I have friends who forward me emails that get sent out to departments. I have, you know, friends around the country. Um, so if, let's say, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to, do anything that would make it seem who, you know, I don't want to out any of my friends. So let's say the, the, the chair of psychiatry at, at a medical school at, you know, an Ivy League school, um, after, after uh, George Floyd uh, died, mm -hmm. for example, a large blast email goes out to all the psychiatry residents saying something to the effect of, oh, we share your pain. We know you are all so upset by, you know, this heinous event where a black man died or a woman died. I mean, these are these are only go out at the things that, you know, pop up on the headlines of, of CNN as a as a as some sort of social injustice mm -hmm. crime. And they send out these things that that really support the idea that they too, the, the chair of the department also is very concerned about America and democracy and justice in America. And they offer, you know, free counseling for all the psychiatry residents who are so fragile that they're not going to be able to give them a day off. They're just so fragile that they won't be able to focus on their work. Medical schools are now training and teaching students and clinical psychology programs are doing this and social work programs are doing this training uh, the, f the clinicians of the future to focus more on the race and the um, sexual identity gender identity <clears throat> orientations of patients and they're filling their heads with a lot of information that's just flat wrong People Completely can't even wrong. agree on what the truth is anymore. <sighs> like from a biological perspective, people are right. arguing that what has, through the scientific lens, since as long as humans have understood or had that lens, what has been true is no longer true. Right, right. I don't know what happens when that occurs. I don't know what happens to our society or culture when we get to that point. Well, I mean, we have a Supreme Court nominee who couldn't define what a woman is. Couldn't or didn't want to? Well, she said she couldn't. I feel like she didn't want to. She said she's not a biologist. I'm not either. I wonder if a biologist could answer that question It would today. depend probably on the setting that you asked it and whether it was public or private. Yeah. Or the social circle that may be there. Yeah. I understand mm -hmm. the social pe pressures that people can face based off the position that they were in. Right. But the truth is the truth, and anything other than that is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worry. I just I don't know where the end, what it leads to, like the end state of that. <clears throat> well, I fear we're going to find out if we don't make some radical adjustments soon, which I just don't see happening. All of... All of, of the academy is dominated now by progressive ideology. Here's an example. University of Hawaii in January of 2022 implemented a vaccine mandate. To be an employee at the university, you had to have the vaccine and you had to upload your card proving you had the vaccine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and they announced it a few months in advance, but as of as of that January, so two years ago, um, and I refused to comply out of principle. And as far as I know, I was the only faculty member who refused to comply. 
as far as I know, in the entire system, not just at the little branch campus where I teach, but the entire system of the University of Hawaii, which has, you know, is a large system and is four, four, four year campuses and I think uh, 10, 12. A lot of remote stuff. Community colleges. Yep. And I was teaching 100% online that semester. So, uh, so they, you know, and I ta had talks with the union. Am I, is this just me? Am I the only one? They're like, yeah, as far as we know, you're the only one. And they, there was nothing like they were, you know, they were really nice. They were sympathetic, but there wasn't anything they could do to help me. So I took the suspension, um, two week suspension without pay, which they didn't, I mean, I knew it was coming, but they didn't like, they just rescheduled my classes. They didn't tell me. I learned the Sunday before classes started from students Hey, professor, emails from students, what's, what's going on? I thought I signed up for your course, and I see there's a different instructor suddenly. And that's how I learned that I had been pulled from all of my classes. So they hired other people to teach my classes. And I took, uh, took the two-week suspension and without pay, and they were, proceed, you know, they were initiating proceedings to terminate me. Uh, I won't, I won't get into the whole, you know, family story of the conversations that took place in my house with my wife, but, um, I did upload a card, uh, waited to the last minute, the last hour and uploaded a card and <laughs> in the next, in the next week, they put me back in, they put me back into my classes. You know, what's fascinating to me, the mental hurdles people will make. I hear people vehemently arguing for pro-choice, but will mandate vaccines. Yeah. That's a, that's a little bit of mental judo going on there. I have the utmost of choice what happens to my body, but you will take a vaccine. You're going to get this jab in your arm. I'm not a fan. Yeah. Not a fan either. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to leave the VA. I was very glad to be leave the VA behind. I, I do have thematic, I won't call them nightmares, but I have these thematic dreams two or three times a year where, and this is true, it's going to sound kind of goofy, but it's real. I dream I'm back at the VA. It's an anxiety dream. I, <laughs> I, I, literally dream, I literally dream I'm back at my old job. Yeah. And I'm looking around going, how did this happen? What happened? How come I'm not back in Hawaii where I thought I was? And I wake up in the morning, or I wake up after it, usually not in the morning, usually right after the dream, I wake up out of the dream anxious and then relieved. That it was a dream. It sounds to me, and I, and I won't put you on the spot for a assessment of whether or not this is true based on your experience, but it sounds like the VA might have gotten itself into a place where budget is primary and everything else is secondary, if not lower downstream, to include the health and welfare mm -hmm. of the benefit uh, the veterans that they're supposed to be treating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The book Wounding Warriors. Uh, is a really it for sure. is a really interesting yeah. book. It's well written. It's very easy to read. It's a page turner, kind of like my book is. So yeah. so well written. It's so exciting and happy, you know you get it. Well, it's not it. even out yet, so let's not tease people with it. Uh, okay. Um, but Wounding Warriors, and it's written by Dan Gate, who was a West Pointer, lost his leg, lost a leg in combat in Fallujah, came home, and you know got the medical treatment and, and got the prosthetic leg. And he's looking around going, why is everybody in the hospital being treated like they're a complete invalid forever? And that kind of started him on his own journey of questioning the VA's policies, disability policies. And he wrote the, he wrote the book with a former Wall Street Journal reporter, Danny Huang. They wrote it together. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. There is a chapter in there on the story I just shared about the the Freedom of Information Act request we studied. They put yeah. a whole chapter in there on that. Um, but Americans don't know what's going on. They don't see it. How could they know? And y you've got a, a country that, uh, you know, most Americans don't even know a veteran. Yeah, 0.05% of the population currently yeah. serving. Yeah. And they and they tend to be in, in this, you know, it tends to run in families. For sure. Lineage, yeah. for sure. Lineage. I so, think it'll finally end with my children. Yes. Your whole, the whole generation of... Your children, I mean, across the board, special. Ten years, everybody except for, fucking God bless the Marines. They're just crushing recruiting numbers. Well, actually, I'm not going to say crushing. They're hitting their goals. But for the last ten years, almost every branch has been under by about a quarter, 25% per That's year. right, yeah. Well, they're not leading with social justice images. 
All the Marines need to do is show a picture of somebody in their class A uniform. God, it's sharp. Yeah. And you're going to get the people that yeah. you need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Navy, if they showed their dress uniforms, recruiting would plummet. <laughs> so <laughs> they need to show other shit. <laughs> but I think it's more about the messaging, not just the uniforms. I completely agree. And not just the reputation. But it's not even messaging from the institution in and of itself, meaning the individual services. It is messaging from mentors or peers or it's the education on what the occupation actually is mm -hmm. as a country it's it's gotten to a place i've heard people in my children's generation you know why would i want to join the military that's like a last you know ditch effort for somebody who has nothing that's for mm -hmm. dumb people I've been, yeah and i've heard them say that i'm like where do you get that impression from oh that's how people talk about it at school are the kids talking about it in school or the parent or the parents or the teachers and it's a little bit of a combination of both mm -hmm. and none of those people really have any actual touch points with the military but that not that i think <coughs> the idolization and spotlight of the pendulum that post 9 11 i don't think that was as healthy either mm -hmm. but it has definitely swung in the other direction mm -hmm. i think it has gone from extreme to extreme yeah well uh, I think part of that is on campus. There is, I mean, the faculty on most university campuses, or let me rephrase that, most of the faculty on most university campuses are, are, are anti-war is not the right, what, it's not the right, quite the right uh, word, because we're all anti-war, are anti, well, toxic masculinity, with air quotes on, around it. Is it what does that even mean? I don't know. That's Just, another one people have a hard time describing. None are bad. Being masculine is bad. But uh -huh. then you ask them to describe masculinity, and what they describe, is it's tough to draw. Right, right. The things that they'll say, I'm like, yeah, those are but, terrible. But Andy, you're asking for logic. I prefer to operate under yeah. some semblance of yeah, logic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All I know is, you know, for example, I have been denounced on my campus publicly for working with veterans and military population. Just specifically for that? Yeah. Chair of sociology. This was probably, two, I don't know, three, four, five years ago. Chair of the sociology department sent out a blast email to the entire campus, faculty and staff, not students, uh, denouncing me for working with guys like you. And okay. part of it was, I think, the you know, the... You know, that I was forcing the patriarchy and the toxic masculinity and, and all of that. The cool thing is, as far as I know, I didn't, I didn't, nobody, the only responses she got were two people who spoke up and defended, you know, veterans and spoke up and defended yeah. um, my work with veterans and, and military. We don't, we, on my campus, we have a, we have a women's center. We have a, a center for LGBTQ population we have a center for native hawaiians we have a center for you know several other centers for for people who are are viewed as marginalized and all of that's fine i i think we should have those programs what we don't have is a, is a center for veterans we don't have any veterans clubs on campus although there's some veterans now trying to start a club and we don't have a men's center we have a women's center 60 percent of our campus is is female mm-hmm if assuming you can define, I mean, that's the funny thing. We can't define a woman, but we have a woman's center. We don't have a men's center. So I think people, I think, you know, half of America would just like, you, you could talk to, tell people the stories and they're, they're, they just can't believe. Because, because they, it doesn't because directly touch their life. Well, because it's so shocking from where we used to be as a country. As Not a that long ago. Not that long ago. Do you think it is accelerating or decelerating? Oh, it's accelerated. Now, maybe <clears throat> things are starting to turn a little bit. Maybe. We're, we're going to find out here real soon. Sure. <laughs> I'll keep this story slightly broad. <laughs> this happened yesterday. No. What day is today? Fuck. Thursday. Yeah. Today, Friday. Good God. This happened Wednesday. There is a, you know, at some point in time, children go through like, uh, not necessarily sex ed, but I'm trying to think of the name of the class. It's health. 
And uh, it was expressed to me from a parent that just the rel- – I viewed it as hilarious, as did this person, the conversation they were having with their child. Like, God damn it. I got to – there's a girl I'm interested in, but I need to send them a questionnaire and ask them at any point in time in their life, did they have a penis? And then I need proof. <laughs> if I have to find out the old-fashioned way, like, I'm going to go jump off a bridge. <laughs> how, how old? How old was this this child? Uh, early teens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that I mean, we do have what I think is a social phenomenon of, of uh, social contagion. How do we stop it? Man. Or can it be stopped? Does it have to run its course like a lot of other things do before? Of course, it goes off the rails, and then the course correction is as horrendous as what got it off the rails. That would be my... That's what I think is probably going to have to happen. Yeah. Yeah, when you can't agree upon a foundation of truth, I don't know if you can build anything from that. Well, where do you find truth in America now? Do you find it in politicians? Do you find it in the media, the mainstream yeah. media? Do you no. find it in, a, in the universities? Do you find it in medical schools? Do you find it in um, formerly revered institutions like the FBI? Do you I think f- those are tougher. You know, I mean, I guess, I don't know, fuck it. But I mean, if you lose it from a scientific perspective as well. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, right. that, that kind of, if you, if the hmm? foundation of truth, if we can't even define it, it a black and white term from objective science. If that's gone, how could you expect any of those other platforms to hold any level of validity? I think, I mean, you're right. I agree 100%. I think part of the, you know, our media are no longer honest with us. Oh, I think that's been happening for a long time. Yes, yes. I (coughs) I agree. It's editorialized. Always. Always. Yeah. Now, but now everything is editorialized. I mean, did Walter Cronkite always tell us the truth? Hard to say. Hard to say. Yeah. Uh, I kind of suspect he, he tried to, you know, most of yeah. the time. I don't think his job would have been at risk if he had said a woman is not a woman or a woman is a woman. Not during his time. In yeah. the modern time. <laughs> In the modern time. That's my point. Yeah. 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 I mean, we've had we've seen just such a shift of standards and and i you know having a daughter and having women in my life that i care about my wife one it's not an (laughs) what is happening is not something that can be solved by men but if women don't step up and protect the rights that they have fucking fought and bled for as usual dudes are gonna fuck this all up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> but we can't solve it it's got they are gonna yeah. have to they're gonna have to hold the line yeah and i it's amazing to me and well, i guess it's not amazing i mean there's obviously you, a variety of beliefs things but hearing women arguing that somebody with a penis is not biologically different than the other women in a changing room because that's what they identify as that's it i don't i can't i can't Jumble that Rubik's Cube in my head to make it all the same color on one side. I just don't understand it as a person. Yeah. Well, and then sports. Yeah. It's. I mean, what? I'm sure it was just sheer luck that somebody can go from the nth hundredth person in the male category to the top of the female category. I'm sure that's because men and women are totally equal. Like, come on. What's the solution to that? Um... The ones that I think make the most sense, because here's what I do believe. I do, I want people to live their most fulfilling and empowered life. And I, not an expert in any of this, but I do believe there are probably people out there who feel like they are trapped in the wrong body. No question. No question. Totally think it's real. And and there's probably a biological basis for that for some people. Agreed. I don't know if we upend the entire system that our society is based upon because of that. I think that having a category in between is probably, if you want to use the term fair, and I know the fair is in fucking Iowa and they serve cotton candy and, you know, all that shit. Men should compete against men. 
women should compete against women. If you want to cross over and compete against the opposite sex, I think that there needs to be a category in the middle that allows for that because otherwise sure. the playing field is not equal. Yeah. How many how many uh, females, uh, biological females who have transitioned to, to males go on to compete in men's sports? I have heard of it. They the res and the results are largely what you think they would be. There are physiological differences, whether it's bone density, stamina, strength, mu muscle, like muscle mass. It fucking is what it is. Yeah. And that one is almost <clears throat> it's a slippery slope because people say, "Well, in that direction, okay, that's fine. In the other one, it shouldn't be." It's like, come on, guys. Like, if maybe the category in the middle is the best example for that. You know, again, I'm not an expert. I don't want people to not live their most fulfilled life. But to think that all of a sudden the statistics on this have gone up at a trajectory that is no longer linear and looks like an Elon Musk rocket headed to Mars. Mm -hmm. And to say that people aren't gaming that, I we live in a different world. I wonder if there's any data on the percentage of uh, people competing in female sports who are born biological males and vice versa. As far as like the result? Yeah, just, just the number. What percentage? I would wonder. I don't know if it's been going on long enough for them to really have good data yeah. on that. Yeah. How about something like the w, WNBA? The WNBA. WNBA? The, yeah, the Women's Basketball Women's Basketball yeah. League, <clears throat> professional basketball league. I wonder, if, I wonder if there are biological males playing. Michael? Yeah, I'm looking right now. Michael's That's awesome. an interesting question. He's awesome. Michael's awesome. And, I mean, you... <sighs> And you're right to go back to your your point a moment ago about it's going to take females maybe to be the ones to step up and they, it's the only way it's going to happen. And and you've seen I mean, Riley Gaines, a very brave young yeah. young woman, crucified, crucified brutally. Yeah, as as was her all of the teammates who stood with her. And I believe the NCAA finally reversed their decision on that one. So perhaps it is swinging back in the other direction. Okay. Is it all right? Uh, it's the first openly non. Openly but this non is non binary, not transgender, so I don't know if I get lost in a lot of that. I would say that that probably doesn't necessarily meet the criteria of what we were talking about. I don't mean that in any negative fashion. I just get a little bit lost in the pronouns. I guess she's had top surgery, apparently. Hmm. Okay. So I'm not quite sure. Um, if she's had top surgery, then wouldn't that be just a woman competing in the WNBA? My, I'm under the impression that top surgery is removing the breasts. That's what it is. Well, I mean, I guess it could be breast implants. It could be. We can't can't see enough in the pictures. Yeah, I sure. am going to make absolutely no assumptions on that because that's where it gets into a slippery slope. <laughs> We're going to get a lot of hate mail for this. <laughs> Maybe. I wanted. I want. Can I get, just give a shout out to my students at the University of Hawaii right now? Of course. Yeah, you know, because you know, so that after I lose lose my job, they'll know I still love them. Uh, people, we, it, so I have exactly zero seconds of education beyond high school, but I would like to think that higher education is a melting pot of ideas where they are openly discussed. You can bring ideas to the table that may not be palatable to other people, but you yeah. can work your way through that yeah. because in my opinion, words do not equate to violence. I know that there are people who will say that those things, in my opinion, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. So although somebody might say something that is atrocious to you, mm -hmm. you don't have to be offended by it and you can work your way through that. And if it is truly atrocious and a horrible idea, you can destroy them in a logical conversation and highlight that. But that's not what we teach in schools. Well, like anymore. you're saying, that's what I hoped it would be. Yeah. I'm aware that it's yeah. probably not that. Yeah. Well... It's not. It's not that anymore. Was it ever, though? Yeah, well, f I mean, I think it's all a matter of degree. Yeah. We've always had propaganda. We've always had uh, narratives that people had to follow or tried to follow. We've always had group think. I mean, go back to the 1960s. How many of the Vietnam War protesters really on college campuses really knew what they were protesting? You can see that in a lot of the current social justice causes. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
there's far less of them, but when you get a hold of some of these YouTube videos, when people are asked about, yep. you know, why they're there, they can yeah. answer that question, but you go a few layers deep into what, the onion and it really gets unraveled. What river are we talking about? What sea are we talking about? And they yeah. don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Protesting uh, climate change and oil while wearing largely oil-based clothing mm -hmm. and signs-based mm -hmm. uh, completely created. Mm -hmm. oil. Mm -hmm. Hey, how many, how many of those folks have given up their mobile phones? Yeah. Yeah. I, the one I don't get is, uh, <clears throat> and I saw this the other day, people are throwing like powder on like the display case of the constitution. I saw that. I saw that. What, I don't, what's the move there? I don't get it. What I hope is it's just a symbolic. They're not actually damaging anything. That powder can just be. Oh, no, no. You know. it, I mean, the constitution, and I've never seen it in person, but from my understanding is there's layers of security around right, it. Like right. So it's right. not. So it's symbolic. It's symbolic, but. Yeah. Are you really going to get anybody's attention or change? I saw the headline that that happened and scrolled on to the next. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think that's symbolic. It's better than throwing, you know, actual soup on a on an actual masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah. That seems Hanging to be a little a, bit more European style. Yeah. Why would you? God, how, God, how could you destroy some of those things or even attempt to? Oh, well, who who destroys art? The Taliban destroyed as much of the ancient art in Afghanistan yeah. as they could. I mean, that's how you... Uh, Did Hitler destroy art or was he collecting it? I think he collected art. He stole it. I get it. really lost in the history of that. And then sometimes He's, it's like Indiana Jones. I'm like, which one of those storylines is... Hitler burned books, Yeah, but he stole and collected and hoarded. That's what I think it was. Yeah. So he wasn't art. destroying art. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wild time we live in. Well, it is. Are you hopeful? Or are you concerned? Mm. Well, I'm definitely concerned. I'm concerned about the young people. Um, like I said, I love my students. They're really good kids. They're good people. Um, they want to. They want the same thing we all want. They want to be happy. Yeah. They want. They want to have a life that is fulfilling and meaningful to them. Uh, my students at the University of Hawaii, they're not ideological for the most part. Uh, they are there to learn. They are there. Yeah, many of them are there to learn. They're all there to get a degree. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't get much of the... I can't imagine what it would be like to teach at a, you know, an Ivy League school today or any, like, any of the big universities from what I hear from my, my friends who teach <coughs> at, at, at those schools. Uh, and I try not to name name schools because I don't want to. I don't want anybody to connect dots to to my friends. But uh, most of my my friends who teach at other schools are terrified of their students. Terrified of what the students uh, could do to their careers and to their lives. That sounds like a completely non functional learning environment. It is. It is. So they self censor, and there's there's studies out there that. that we all do at times too. Everybody does. Yeah. But Some of us less than others, which, you know, I've been known to let a few things fly. The internal filter might be thinner on some of us yeah, than others. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're there teaching biology and you're self censoring your, your view that of what a woman is, I think that's a problem. I would agree with you. And I'm <clears throat> and I don't know anybody who falls into that category, but I definitely have friends who just they're they're terrified of their students because all it takes in some places and probably all places is for a student at, to level an accusation at a professor or an instructor, one of their course instructors, that they were insensitive to you name it. Yeah. Um, heaven forbid you look at a, you know, this is again, I, I've never dealt with this, but I've heard, I've seen friends go through this, you know, they hugged a student in the hallway or a student reported that they looked at them for too long in a way that made them uncomfortable. Um, the universities don't have a have a have a due process anymore. They many universities assume that the student is telling the truth, assume that the student was assaulted. Uh, they make the argument that that words are violence, and um, how does that one breadcrumb out? Words to violence. The only people I know who think that words are violence are people who have never, never experienced violence. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Because if you have experienced violence, yeah. there is a Grand Canyon yeah. difference between being punched in the mouth and being told, I don't like you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, most of us have not been punched in the mouth. Well, that's boring. It is. Um, have you tried? I have been punched in the mouth. I was going to say, go to a bar and just tell somebody, hey, just start talking shit to them. Like, and I'm joking, everyone. This is not actual, <laughs> actual, actionable advice. <laughs> you almost punched a guy in the mouth today, I think. Nope. Not even close. Not even close. Not even close. You didn't think about it? No. If he would have touched me, he would. I would have left with his arm, but that's on him. I, I was not going to initiate violence on that individual in any way, shape, or form. I don't like violence until I am pushed to that place. Okay. In at that situation, fuck it, I'll talk about it. We put up uh, on social media from our coffee shop yesterday that we had our first incident of theft. Within 60 minutes, that individual was identified and where they worked. And I wanted to provide that person the opportunity to do the right thing. So. Why? Because I realize human beings are flawed and we all fall short of who we want to be from time to time. And I don't know what's going on in his life. I could tell on social media that there was a family, that there was kids. I don't know why people would choose to steal things and the things that they stole. You know, I've heard this one too. When people steal Gucci bags, that's reparations, you know, that they need to be able to eat. And I'm like, mm. um, uh, okay, that's an extreme example. I don't know why somebody would steal the items that they did, but I don't live in anybody else's head. And I've had moments where I fall short and I have had moments where people provided me the opportunity to do the right thing. And that was far more impactful to me mm. than like getting in trouble or being slapped on the wrist. And it was a, a not a incredible monetary level of theft. Um, and I gave the individual the choice. You can come back and pay for these or I will go to the police. And he said, I'll be there. And, you know, I'm on my way. And I said, you have 60 minutes or it's going to the police, which I had already told the police what had happened. And they had actually reached out to us like, we know who this person is. Let us know if you need any help. Hmm. It is more of a lesson for that person to have to walk back into that store, face me on the other side of the register, yeah. let me look at him while he is charged for the items that he stole, pay for it, and then explain to him that he is no longer welcome in the establishment. If he ever comes back, we're going to have a fucking problem. That is a more impactful way to deal with that yeah. than have him getting a ticket from KPD. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. There, you know, there's some truth to why do you kill a fly with a hammer sometimes? And it's just so the other flies will pay attention. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make them any mm -hmm. more dead. Mm -hmm. I try not to always be a hammer looking for a nail. I have fallen so short of who I want to be at times that I do the best that I can to at least see that in other people. Mm -hmm. And it's fucking tough sometimes, especially if you get emotionally involved. But for this one, I was like this. Okay. Like we can solve this problem. And he came in and paid. He did. Within about 10 minutes. What was that like? Awesome. Was there a conversation? It's just at the register when he paid. And, yeah. yeah. And I just and I told him what was going to happen when I went and saw him. I said, you know, you're going to be officially trespassed after this, and I'll report his name to law enforcement so he can't come back onto the property. And he looked me in the eyes. I was telling him, as he paid, I said, okay, you have been officially trespassed. If I see you again on this property, you and I are going to have a fucking problem. He said, he said thank you, sir. I understand. Mm -hmm. And walked out. Okay. And he can think about that and deal with that. Yeah. That's more impactful yeah. than a ticket. hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to force legal action on somebody. For, you know what I mean? Like it, it was like $102 worth of stuff. Not minor, not major. Again, I don't know what's going on in his life, mm -hmm. but I'm going to give you the chance to do the right thing because I've needed that chance at times in my life. Sure. I like But that God one. help him if he would have touched me. I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I won't initiate violence, but if you put me into that place, yeah, stand the fuck by. I like that, and I think you know it'd be nice if we had a little more of that approach in, our, in just in our justice system. It's tough, more broadly. It's hard. You want to. It's so easy to judge people with a more critical lens than even you yourself could survive. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking through a right. a pane glass window. Right. Like, well, what if I turned it into a mirror? Right. How would you survive that yeah. level of scrutiny and criticism? Yeah. Don't don't throw stones when your own house is glass. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, and it was less paperwork. There's oh, that. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, oh, hell yeah. Let's not forget that aspect. <laughs> 
Well, that's significant. See, some social media can be good. Oh, you put this out there on social media? Fuck yes. Did you put his identity? I mean, if the, by that you mean a close-up of his face, absolutely. <laughs> is that on Instagram? Yes. Okay. I gotta, yes, check, I gotta go check that out. I'm not a social media person, but I did. I have started a social media. As it's, a clinician, you're gonna be disgusted by what you see. Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, well, he's, sort of, sort of. Um, I, I do have an Instagram now, as, yeah. as of about two weeks ago. Um, it is what you make of it. It's yeah. a, it's again, it's a tool. Yeah. Um, I do think that it should be. The more I've seen the impact it can have, even on my own life, it should almost be like a pill bottle. Take two a day. Mm. You know, don't exceed more than four in a twenty-four hour time frame. Mm -hmm. There is a toxic nature to it, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if most people recognize that. Mm. And it's insidious. And it's just, it's like just sucking your time up. Yeah. And it's so entertaining that you don't realize the time that you've lost. I guess people kind of describe getting these dopamine hits. I guess. It's, I don't know. It's a. I also think a lot of people have almost no visceral physical experiences in their life, so maybe they are getting it from that. I don't know. Well, younger people, I think this is one of the, one of the horrible things that has happened. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a college student's fault that somebody invented social media uh, 20 years ago and and created this almost like this octopus with tentacles everywhere uh, into their lives. Um, you could say, well, maybe you shouldn't use it so much, but that's a, that's a tough thing to say because you, grow up, you yeah. grow up addicted to it. And their entire social circle, yeah. they yeah. actually, yeah. it's yeah. interesting with my kids, you know, God, I'm not even going to use my dad. Oh, Michael, you like this. He was at the coffee shop today. My dad is 172 years old. Um, <clears throat> You know, he was, went to school writing with coal on a shovel and, like, candlelight, shit like that. Test drove the first Model T Ford. <sighs> the number of stories I have about him at electronics are fascinating. He's downstairs at the coffee shop today. And I walk down there like, Dad, what are you doing? He couldn't figure out how to turn the ringer back on on his iPhone. So he went to the manager of the store. And he's on, like, an iPhone 3. My man needs an upgrade. So like, the battery life on this thing sucks. He'll charge it to 100%, and it's it's gone in half a day. Uh, it's also 10 years old, if not more, and he it just was the little button. And Connor, our manager, is such a sweetheart. She's like, I'll be tech support for you. Yeah, it's, God, it's challenging. I can't laugh because I have the same problems. Not to this level. I'm only 100 years old. And I have the same problems. No, I mean, I'm talking to my dad when he first got a laptop. It was like, hey, how come you never respond to my emails? And I had him walk me through what he was doing. And he was writing them and then closing his laptop without hitting send. Mm. So his draft folder was robust. Nice. Sent items, a mm. little thin. <laughs> I know a lot of people I wish they would not send the emails that they yeah. send. Yeah. I don't know how we got on my dad. But yeah, he is a uh, fuck. He's a character. Let's talk about operator syndrome. I was just going to ask you, please yeah. tell me about it. Tell me about the book and actually, I mean, the, it's the title of a book, obviously, but what it means as well. Um, can you clarify your question a little? Well, obviously it's the title of your book, but what is the term operator what syndrome? What is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, operator syndrome is a description. It's a framework. It's not a diagnosis. It's a framework for that I and, and others, um, I've been a lot, I have a lot of fellow travelers here, including co-authors on a medical paper we published about four years ago. And it, it's, it, the idea is operators, and, and we, I and we, many of us, but myself here, I'll speak for myself, define the phrase operator broadly, not formally. I mean, there's a formal definition. But I would include uh, many other, you know, EOD technicians, mm -hmm. private defense contractors. You don't ever actually see it in doctrine. It's like it's an internal term, but I yeah. bet you it actually yeah. the, the yeah. definition yeah. deviates based off of service. Yeah. It's in the vernacular, but it's not doctrinal. It's a little bit odd, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know there is a formal definition, and I kind of have an awareness of what it is, so I feel the need to, to say that. Yeah. Um, but you guys, I'll just say you guys. Uh, you operators, you have uh, incredibly different experiences than pretty much everybody else in the world. I would agree. It's 
in part the selection and the mindset. It's in part, it's massively in part the training. Uh, that's something people don't understand is the training alone uh, has a multitude of effects and traumatic brain injury uh, is probably uh, runs at about 95 to 100 percent from the first year of training alone, first few months of training. Yep. And then, of course, there there's the things that you do when you're you're sent off into the world, um, including deployments and missions. Are, are incredibly unique and lead to a unique pattern of injuries. That's it. That's a framework for understanding those pattern of injuries and putting them into the context, which is partly cultural, the context where those injuries occur. And it's partly related to the idea that the severity of those injuries um, is, in some ways, is very unique, but it's also the interrelated connectedness of those injuries. So... The first, uh, the first, one of the very first Navy SEALs that I ever, you know, was friends with and had conversations with, and this is going back about a decade, was, I mean, his, we, we refer to the, we use the term presenting complaint. His presenting complaint was, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with me, but I'm not myself anymore. Full stop. And I said, well, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with you either, but it's probably PTSD, right? Because you're, you're a veteran, combat veteran. At that moment in time, I thought maybe my PTSD expertise would, was what he needed to, you know, some conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just a friend. This was not, a, this was not in a, a clinical sense at all. Pretty much none of my work has been in a, cl a true clinical sense. Uh, remember, I'm not with VA. I don't work for the military. That's probably why people are willing to talk to you. Probably is. Probably is. I also don't keep records or notes. Okay, your memory is better than mine then. No, my memory's not that good. Well, yeah, because you have operator syndrome. I don't have a TBI. I identify as somebody who doesn't have operator syndrome. I identify you as somebody who is probably has a traumatic brain injury. I identify as someone without one. Does the, What does the VA identify you as? I identify as somebody who doesn't recognize the VA. <laughs> I'll play this 2024 fucking game. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all, hey, all's uh, fair. You're correct in all those it, things. It all goes. So I can't make a diagnosis on myself, and I always tell people, like, maybe let somebody else give you a little bit more objective feedback. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so and we can go through this. We can come back and go through the, all of this as much as you want, maybe put a lot of the conversation on, on the traumatic brain injury because people don't understand that. People really don't understand that. Yeah. They, they think it's, oh, you blown up in an IED on Red uh, Irish. I mean, yeah, that counts as one. But That counts as one. What about eating breaching charges all day long exactly. internally in the kill house or it, really hard parachute openings? Or how about just hitting your head on shit at nighttime because we're running around with our yeah. hair on fire? Yeah. Uh, I, one way of, of saying that is there's impact forces which cause concussions. There's blast wave exposures which cause a, a shearing force as the blast wave goes through the soft tissue of your body, including your brain. Then there's the other things, the oxygen deprivation, uh, the chemicals, the radiologicals, the biologicals. The fun stuff. All the good stuff. The, uh, the, the being choked out and grappling. Grappling wasn't really a thing when I was in, actually. I missed the wave of that. Okay. It was onboarding. I found it later in life. Hmm. Michael knows about being choked yeah, out. Yeah, that's why I was kind yeah. of looking over at him to see. Michael identifies as somebody who yeah. taps often. <laughs> yeah, I do. I never, I, I've never been choked out. You're Tap, missing out on nothing. Tap early and often. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yes. So, yeah, I mean, I talk to guys, oh, yeah, five, six, ten times being choked out. Um, I mean, there's really a lot of things that you can do to prevent that. main one is, and like, like, yeah. or maybe, did you ask them if it was a fetish? Because there's that. Ooh. Yeah, what was the context? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we were don't you wearing that. a dive mask with a shit-filled dive sock, beating each other with it? Like, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's the you know there is diving, so there's some oxygen issues there. Um, well, unless you're on a Drager, that's Puro too. Great hangover. Great hangover. R a recovery tool. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the then there's the real competitive sport of all of special operations uh, that usually comes in a bottle. So oh, drinking sometimes out of a keg. Just remember, everywhere in the SEAL pipeline, it says it pays to be a winner. Mm -hmm. It does not quantify what, what that, that is a winner at. at yeah. So, of course, yeah. the assumption is everything. Yeah. So, 
It's a, so operator syndrome, a framework, I, I put it as starting at traumatic brain injury. But some of the other experiences of sleep deprivation, the circadian disruption, yeah. the, the massively high operational tempo throughout a career, it's not just one, it's not just on the deployment of going out every night or going, you know, day after day. But the, you know, even when you, even when you're home, you're oper home, even when you're in the stateside, your operational tempo is is mm -hmm. incredibly high. So the stress horm hormones never have a chance to clear out. You never have a chance to really catch up on your sleep. With the TBI and sleep deprivation, your your production of testosterone is crushed. Which, as you know, working with the special operations community, one of the most common things is testosterone in the fucking basement. 80, 90... 95%. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to the point where attach, attacking the natural systems in the body to try to revamp that up, it doesn't even work anymore. It's completely dysregulated. It gets burned out at some point. Yeah. So TBI, hormonal dysregulation, sleep disruption, the sleep apnea is really high. The rates of sleep apnea is really mm -hmm. high. Um, you might consider getting another sleep study to see if you have sleep apnea if you don't already. I did not have it at NICO. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought maybe you had. I assumed. No, I did not okay. have sleep apnea. Okay. No, in the sleep study that I was done, I did not present with sleep apnea. You did apnea. not present. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would be worth. I mean, well, checking out again. I mean, if, if if anybody tells you you snore heavily, or that they've witnessed you, I've never heard myself snoring. Not, so I don't think I do. Not have you ever stopped breathing in your sleep? Not that I remember. Has anybody <laughs> told you that you stop breathing in your sleep? My wife has told me has told me that I not only snore but I have very irregular breathing. Get get yourself a fucking sleep at, sleep study. I mean, maybe polysomnography. That's the official term for it. I'm gonna need get to write that down later. Get one of those. <laughs> get one of those polysomnography. Okay. Then we have so just going down the list. Oh, actually, I brought you a list. Oh dear God. Uh, it's, it's not a list. It's this a is where things like this suck because you're like, yes, 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 yes. It's a checklist. Um, I'll just read it out to you. Sure. So traumatic brain injuries, sleep disturbance, endocrine dysfunction, chronic pain. Yeah. I mean, and you know what's interesting is that you get used to it. Your baseline yeah. for what is yeah. normal yeah. is yeah. It, yeah. you're just like, yeah, I feel like shit. And the guy's like, yeah. yeah, but that's what we feel like. Yeah, but you don't have to. That can be treated. Yeah. can be treated with regenerative medicine. What does that mean? Like vampire blood? Regeneration. Like the crazy Silicon Valley dude who's on his $2 million a year kick mm -hmm. to like- I don't think it's that expensive. Have more active erections at nighttime? He needs 18-year-old erections at nighttime? I don't think it's that expensive, $2 million. Here's but a question. Why is a dude in his 50s so open to talking about his erectile function at night with national media? Normal, right? <laughs> Anybody who spends two million dollars a year on stuff, I, I don't, I don't know. I well, he's a billionaire, so I don't, I okay. don't know what oh. that is to them. Is that well, like I dropped a twenty out of my wallet? That's like a cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, how many surgeries? How many orthopedic surgeries? Have I have had? had one, but it was in December. Oh, okay. I had never broken a bone or had a surgery or been put under until then. Okay. A lot of guys I know have had five, ten mm -hmm. orthopedic surgeries. Um, most of the guys I talk to have li live with chronic pain in every joint in their body. And they don't do anything about it because they don't. They just accept it and think that that's the way life is supposed to be. Yep. You don't have to live with it. Headaches every day. Headaches. You have headaches every day. Yep. Okay. How severe? Probably sits between a three to a five every day. Uh, do you have other things associated with them, like light or sound sensitivity? Depends on the severity of the headache. Sometimes. Okay. How about um, nauseousness or vomiting? Nope. Not due to headaches. Any. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's a probe. I Sometimes I get, back like, to... you could play ceviche roulette at the airport, you know? Yeah. How about, um, do you get Gas a... station sushi? I mean, come on. There's a lot of reasons you could be nauseous. You play a lot of roulette when it comes to flying. It so dangerously, like. you know? How about uh, the aura, the visual aura? Do you have any of that? I've only experienced that after uh, head trauma. Okay. For a short period. I know what you're talking about. It's hard to describe, but it's like yeah. that almost angelic... Little floating aura. lights. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yep. Kind of like the northern light. Only after like, good noodle cracks. Good noodle cracks. What do you do for those headaches? How do you treat them? Continue on with your day. Yeah, just like your chronic pain. Just, to, just. There's what you need to do in your day, and then you need to get it done. Mm -hmm. Do you have a headache right now? Yeah. Did I cause it? No. Okay. Um, depression. I would say I uh, have hard days, but so should everybody. So I don't. You know, I don't think I've ever been clinically depressed. Okay. I mean, some days are shitty. 
Yeah. You just got to deal. Well, life is shitty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So being sad because something happened, being angry because something happened, short term, you know, these are usually transient I also things. don't think they should be medically treated. I think you should expect to experience a range of emotions and work your way through them. I agree, 100%. In many ways, we have medicalized human suffering. Yeah. But depression, major depressive disorder, is a real thing. Totally agree. And I'm what I'm saying is I don't think I've ever experienced yeah. that, but I have nothing but empathy for people who yeah. have because yeah. I've heard fucking horror stories. Yeah, yeah. Anxiety. I don't think I generally get anxious. Do you worry about stuff? Oh, God, yes. What is what else are you supposed to do with your time? <laughs> um, most people don't worry all the time. Well, they probably live boring lives that are non complicated. Okay, how complicated is your life right now? There's a lot of shit going on. Really? Like what? Uh, some of it I'll have to tell you off air because it's recently developing. Okay, and is not directly associated, tied to myself, but peripheral to my family. Situational. Yep. Yeah. Well, back to life its own self. Um, Involves loss and tr yep. stress and adversity and sad, sad things. Um, anger. Sometimes. Yeah. A lot of guys have some problems with anger. Sometimes things make you angry. And so therefore the response of being anger, in my mind, is normal. It's what you do with the anger or don't that I think is important. Okay. Right. Agreed. And Marcus Aurelius would say, you know, I don't know what he would exactly say, but the stoic idea is you can be angry, but not show it or not, not give it the power over yeah. you. It takes practice. It takes practice. Uh, Hypervigilance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's an aspect of that yeah. for sure. Which isn't necessarily a symptom. It, it, it's a, I just call that paying attention. It's a behavioral adaptation to, yeah. you know, to threat. Yeah. We don't live in as safe of a world as people think. We That's also right. don't live in as dangerous of a world as a lot of people are told. Right. I was taught for many years to make life and death decisions off of fractions of pieces of information, and I don't think that's something that you can turn off. I'm aware of it, and I right. try to turn it down. Yep. That's it. Yeah. Like you just hit the nail on the head. Uh, we've talked about PTSD. Substance abuse is pretty common. A lot of guys with, uh, you know, a lot of operators have perceptual system impairments. Perceptual system impairments. Uh, hearing. I mean, we all have tinnitus. Well, I don't. Yeah, but you're talking about guys with okay. our previous background. We all operators. Yeah. Tinnitus, a lot of hearing loss. Um, we always we were not always the smartest with having our ear pro on. And then sometimes you were uh, surprised by loud, yeah. bangy things. Yeah. How's your vision? Blurry vision, double vision? I had PRK, so it's pretty good. Okay. How's your balance? I think it's amazing. Probably the best that's ever been measured. Among all of humans? I think I'm top top, top of the heap. Okay. No, it's fucking normal. I'm like an aggressively average athlete. I don't have any worse or better balance than anybody else. What about any changes to your, like your hand-eye coordination? Hard to say because, again, it's like where do we measure this from? 18 before I joined the military, middle of my career. Because what I don't have is any paperwork or data from that time period. Right. That's fair. I would say hand-eye coordination is Oh, man. Probably about the same. What I hear a lot from uh, clumsiness, dropping things, mm, tripping, I mean, I, stumbling. Well, so I have nerve damage from getting shot in my hip. Mm -hmm. um, so I, like my balance on my left foot is not great, but I also can't articulate my foot in a normal way. Okay. So is it really my balance or my limited range of motion? Right. So sometimes is I- it the t Is it TBI or is it that nerve injury? That's, that would be that's the what nerve, you're saying. Nerve yeah. injury for sure yeah. on that one. Yeah. But that yeah. also, like sometimes yeah. I do trip because yeah. of the weird articulation of my yeah. ankle. Yeah. Um, another pretty common problem a lot of guys have is cognitive impairments, concentration, short-term memory, focus. That was one of my main things I tried to express at NICO was I feel like my brain does not work the way that it used to. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any fucking data to support that. Mm -hmm. But I know that it is slower. Do you, what do you do to accommodate? Just live life. Oh, but, but how do you keep yourself on course with things? Slowly work my way through them. I mean, just to keep lists, post-it notes. I do. I have alarms, like a notebook. Well, I've always kept lists, notebooks. though. Notebooks. Notebooks, yes, but that's because earlier in my life, somebody repeated a quote from Einstein, who's relatively smart, who said, "Why well, try to remember something you can just write down?" Yeah. Well, and I keep notes and lists too. I'm, I, if I don't keep them, it's not like I'm lost in my life by any yeah. stretch. I okay. keep them because it's like 
I rake and we're like, this is what I need to do in the morning and like get my way through it. Yeah. Okay. Um, marriage, marital problems, family problems, stemming from issues related to military or these other injuries. Because everything that we've just talked about, it bleeds into the family, of course. It is easy for people to say my marriage failed because of what I used to do. The harder one is, is you actually you were an alcoholic asshole who was fucking everything that would let you when you were on the road. And that is what imploded your marriage. And oh, mm -hmm. by the way, yeah, you also had that job. And I'm not saying that that mm -hmm. is the vast majority of people, but there's an aspect of that. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you connect the dots between the job and the failure of a relationship? Yeah. I don't know how to do that. Well, it doesn't really even matter yeah. well, what we, I mean, it matters. But it doesn't matter if we're precise about it, because one of the things that we've seen is, what's the divorce rate in special operations? Oh, it's got to be above 80%. Well, I think it's like 200%. How's that possible? Uh, oh, they get married more than once? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah. It pays to be a winner. <laughs> <laughs> I've been divorced once. You know, I'm remarried now. Okay. Yeah. And when did you get remarried? August 20th of 2023. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. You're still Actually, 2022. What year is it? 2022. Uh -oh. You just got in trouble there. No way. She won't listen to this. I'm like the most boring person she's ever fucking met. Yeah. She's probably tired of your shit. Um, I mean, I'm tired of my shit. How could somebody else not be? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not tired of it yet. This is, I'm, I'm enjoying our conversation. So, so yeah, with that, that divorce rate, of course, divorce happens to lots of people. Not at that statistical rate. Yeah. Not at that statistical rate. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of guys who, who are... On their third, fourth marriage. Yeah. Uh, also, maybe that's not healthy too. Which? You know, the third or fourth or, you know, until you can change. And I guarantee you it's a lack of awareness of what might be causing that. Or even probably a lack of awareness of who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. If you can't really achieve that, yeah, you're going to be doing the same thing but expecting a different result. Yeah. So probably not a good idea. And then for a lot of guys, it's like what are the lessons learned from the first or the second marriage and how do they, how do they, you know, do better on the next one? One of the things that, uh, what can I my list here? Number 14, intimacy concerns, which could be emotional intimacy, could be sexual intimacy. No, I'd say good on both. I, I am probably far just, more sensitive than people actually realize. I have shielded it a lot in my life with just kind of being a smart ass and yeah. sarcasm. Yeah. Talked a lot black about humor. Eh, black humor, or it's just deflection more than anything, okay. you know. But I, mm -hmm. I, my kids probably hate how much I want to give them hugs or how much I tell them I love them and yeah. just like want to just hold and just yeah. express that love to them. Yeah, my wife would probably say the same thing. Okay, so for your listeners, I'll share this. I grew up in a in a house that really didn't have any real affection. Yeah, you know, my mom is not a touchy kind of person. My dad either, but when he did give me a hug. As a child, it made me very uncomfortable. Because it was not common? Because it was not common. And then as an adult, later, he, he became more affectionate, you know, yeah. later, you know, when we were all adults. And I always hated hugging my dad. But huh. but something I've noticed is the most affectionate group of people I, I know are operators and their spouses. I think what we used to do for a living actually allows you to love at a deeper level than most people can understand. I accept that. I believe I believe you're right. And and I would the hugs that I get are not just the the polite little. Mm -hmm. hugs. Yeah, your feet are coming off the ground. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like trying to, you know, trying to breathe and struggling with that because I'm being squeezed so hard and for so long. Yeah. Um, and cheek to cheek. Uh, like upper cheek or lower cheek? I what, mean, let's be precise. Where's the divining line? <laughs> I mean, you could, I guess, be inverted. Can we just say the middle <laughs> cheek? <laughs> <Can we> just... <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, let's, uh, I'll keep moving along here. Yep. So so there's the you know, emotional. A lot of guys have to struggle with emotions. I'm meaning, a very sensitive person. Meaning they don't show their emotions. They're not comfortable showing their emotions. They maybe deny their mo emotions. I would say I present probably very flatlined to people. Yeah. But... A lot of rivers seem flat on top, and the current is deep and moving underneath. Yeah. But would you also agree that for a lot of guys that you know that that you have an awareness that they don't that they struggle with affection and yes with their in their 
primary relationships. But again, I don't know if that's because of the job or the job draws that type yeah. of person with the trauma where maybe, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's yeah. so many different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and we can't be sure of the reason for any of these. And yeah. of course, not every operator has everything on this list. And we could talk about sort of what are the core. But if you have a TBI, if you're not sleeping, if you have chronic pain and chronic headaches, and you're coping by drinking too much or using other chemicals, you know, I think we're going to, we could acknowledge that that's going to vector in on your, on your relationships and your emotions. Oh, for sure. Well, it's going to impact every aspect of your life. Every aspect of your life. Right. The sexual intimacy concerns are also, uh, I think, um, something that I see. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, in, in our, in the medical paper we wrote in 2020, I had a section in there talking about some of this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, we had a paragraph in there and I think it was two paragraphs. Initially, the second paragraph was about the use of pornography and infidelity Hmm. in the lifestyle. Um, Morgan Luttrell, who was a co-author on the paper, persuaded me to take that out at that time. Why? Um, He didn't want to stigmatize. He didn't want to put anything that was... How about we just be honest? Yeah. Well, it's in my book. Yeah. Talk about it in there. It is a real problem. And, you know, you have guys who are, you know, um, physical beasts, many of them, all of them. You have a mystique. Uh, You're all handsome as hell. Of course, you're at the top. Um, Yeah. I mean... As you told me earlier. In the third phase of training, we get issued hair gels and mirror. Okay. So, I well, mean, that's a seal thing. We're selecting for it. Special forces doesn't do that. Can't be taught. Yeah. You know, and, um, you're, so you're ro- saying an overactive sexual issues or underactive overactive at certain times. Yeah. And I mean, you're on the road Yeah. or you're overseas. Um, you're far away from family. Um, it is a competitive, it's part of being a competitive high testosterone, uh, toxic masculinity culture and i would imagine i'm kidding about the toxic masculinity oh no i got but, it but I'd there is an element it. there is an element there and then on the tail end if they have a tbi or issues that are impacting their testosterone it probably would lead to the erectile dysfunction yeah, yeah. which Ere- traditionally is actually known to happen to most green berets <laughs> i'm just saying science <laughs> hashtag hashtag science well hashtag hashtag viagra um under the prescription of a doctor, of course. Yes. Oh, yeah. Because God help you if you leave an there untapped, are... monitored bowl of Viagra out. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you said it yourself that you had you had some some stuff going on, some extracurricular activities in your in your life, and I mean, I have very intimate conversations with guys. You know, all the time, every day, pretty much, and, and this is often a theme. Yeah, some, something that people struggle with, and spouses struggle with it too. Um, because spouses are home alone. Spouses are running the families all yeah. by themselves, and they're lonely and they're isolated um, frequently. Uh, oh, okay. It gets better. Okay. There's three more. The transition from service to out of I- service. No, your gender transition. Have you had yours yet? Smooth. It was smooth. You, it was smooth. Yeah. yeah. They did the surgeries and the... I identify... I came back to identifying as who I was. Okay. So it was temporary. So, no. The, the transition <laughs> from military to civilian is really hard. It can and be hard. It's hard for most. Yeah. I happened to have an economic off-road because I was doing moonlighting for a company before I got out. Okay. So I kind of knew what yeah. I wanted to do next. Yeah. Yeah. That helped. Yeah. But you still had to come back to a society of civilians. I never left a society of civilians. I am a civilian. I was a civilian. I was yeah. a part. I mean, yeah. I guess what I did, it's not who I was. Okay. My neighbors were civ- like I was surrounded by them at all times. Okay. Okay. Did you, uh, so you, did you know how to dress for the civilian world? Yeah. Board shorts and a t-shirt. Yeah. There we go. So, I if, mean, just so you know, that is covers me from like going to get a burrito to black tie. I get it. I get it. And my wife would sit right here and be like, it drives her <laughs> fucking nuts. Because I can pack for a trip in five minutes and yeah. it takes her five hours. <laughs> yeah. But we're doing all these things. I'm like, I have more than one pair of shorts. We're fine. That could have been the definition that the SCOTUS nominee could have given <laughs> when asked about the definition of a woman. No, do I? Yeah. Uh-huh. I knew how to dress. I mean, yeah. you can look around and see like what kind of event it is going to be. I mean, 
That's just not. That's not rocket surgery. It is for some. Really? Yeah. Some guys don't know how to dress. Yeah, but we're we're trained to pay attention. Look at the people around you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I get it. It's a challenge for some. No judgment. I'm just. Yeah. yeah that one yeah. surprises me. Yeah. There's even services for. I mean, for veterans in general, not specifically for SEALs. Yeah. But there or Green Berets or MARSOC or PJs, um, or combat controllers. But um, there, there are um, there are services. Hmm. that specifically are there for veterans to kind of help them learn how to dress for different contexts in the civilian sector. All right. Fair enough. I mean, we all come from different backgrounds. Yeah. So. Yeah. I never really knew how to dress for professionally until I was, you know, about 40. I look back at some of the clothing I wore, you know, in my 30s, professional clothing. I'm like, ugh. It's horrible. I mean, there weren't bell bottoms. I wasn't wearing yeah. that kind of stuff. The but. key is to not look back. Yeah. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Especially on how you dressed. Yeah. There's other things that are worth looking back on. All right. So um, toxic exposures. Uh, that comes with a job. Well, well, it does. Yeah. But the rates of cancers, and I'm not saying that cancer itself is part of operator syndrome, but yeah. the rates of respiratory illnesses and cancers. It's galactically high in comparison to any other cohort. Yeah. Galactically high. Yeah. And I'll give a shout out to Hunter Seven a yep. Foundation, uh, Chelsea Simone doing some amazing work. She showed some, she showed some preliminary data to uh, the health board that I chair for Seal Future Foundation last week. And like, we looked at it on a Tuesday. It wasn't even on our agenda. It was just sort of, hey, guys, I've got this, you know, here's some data that just caught off the press. And we looked at it, and we scheduled a second meeting for Thursday of that same week, which we've never done before because it was just so shocking. Yeah. The numbers are just, like, through the roof. It's insane. Especially for uh, the Tier 1 units. That makes sense. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Uh, last... N- absolutely not least are the existential concerns that guys have many guys have and and they aren't just the same thing there's a there's a broad range of different types of existential concerns yeah, give me some examples yeah well you know the modern modern term that i don't even know what it means is moral injury meaning uh, feeling bad about what they had done some guys I'm not going to define the term. Okay. Uh, that's not that's not up to me. I don't use the term myself. I think, I mean, broadly, I think people could agree of maybe what that feels like. Moral injury. I do not feel morally injured at all. I feel morally strengthened. Yeah. I saw, uh, I went to the Impact Forum four, five, six years ago, and a psychologist, Brett Litz, was there presenting on moral injury. Mm-hmm. And he had his book on moral injury that, that was at the, we came back from lunch and it was on the table at every seat. So everybody had their own book. And uh, he was, he started talking. And within about 10 minutes, I would say pretty much every team guy in the room had walked out. Really? Yeah. Walked out uh, offended. Offended by the idea that their morals had been injured. Offended by the implication that they had done horrible things. That's not. That was not the point of the talk. That was not uh, Dr. Litz's intent, and it's not what he said. But but the the way it was cast, the way it gets framed, is is bothersome to a lot of people. Um, that speaks to me more. There's a deeper problem there, and that's how those people think about themselves. Psychologists. I'm talking about the team guys. The fact that they would walk out and be offended by the idea Could that be. perhaps yeah. their morals were injured. Yeah. Well, I mean, logically, how do you, you're, I don't, I don't quite understand the, the, the phrase itself. How we don't have injury morals are not an in, are not a fit, tangible physical thing. How can they be injured? We could violate our morals. Yeah. They could be shifted over time. They could be shifted and changed. Well, I mean, the military asks that occupation to do very difficult things, very challenging situations. And if you view the act outside of the context and often outside of the amount of time you had to make a decision, people would argue until you're blue, they're blue in the face that you have no morals or that you've been morally injured. Right. I did the best that I could in the situations that I was presented with. And you have to look at it holistically, not strip out and parse one thing or the other, because that doesn't, provide or present an accurate picture of what happened. Right. 
And if you do that, you could talk yourself into feeling like you're the devil. So a part of me thinks, wonders, suspects, that the concept of moral injury is something that was developed by people who had never been in combat. I would be shocked if that was not the case. And that it was a is their own reaction to what they imagine or have heard or their own understanding of what they've heard about uh, combat. But let, 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 I actually wrote a list of things that's, that's from my book. I have yeah. a, like a par- just a paragraph on each of these. But let, let's start with the idea that we do have social norms and taboos. For sure. Most of us were raised with some version of the Ten Commandments. Whether All, they do it or not, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and whether we, whether we identify that yep. word again, as Christian or Muslim or Judaism, all of the, these three Abrahamic religions all have essentially some version of the, of the yep. Ten Commandments. And, you know, you, you can't go into the kind of line of work that you, that you do without, you know, killing, without, you know, checking. There are far fewer SEALs that have killed people than you would think. Yeah. Same in the special operations community. It's yeah. not everybody. Right. It's yeah. actually a small fraction. Yeah, yeah. Adultery. High percentage. Yeah. I'm just saying that, that yeah. as a framework, we start with this, yeah. and then we know that some of this has to shift mm-hmm. you know, culturally and contextually uh, when you get into the... Um, and, and so I'm just going to run down my list, but and, and not to say that you yeah. or anybody hits all of these. Some people hit one, some people yep. hit two. Um, but the horror of killing... The thrill of killing. A lot of guys talk have talked with me about they enjoyed killing. It they can miss- be both of those things in exactly the same moment. Yeah, exactly. And can feel that, you know, echoing through their life after. Both, yep. both the thrill and the horror and the guilt of feeling the thrill. Maybe that's what moral injury is. The impossible choices. Yeah. There's frequently, there's no good choice. Yeah, it's, it's not a uh, golden good choice, yeah. demonic black evil choice. Right. Right. It's this sucks and this might suck a fraction of a percentage less. Yeah. Loss. I mean, you know guys that didn't survive their careers. Or after. Or after. Which I would still say is them probably not surviving their career. Yeah, different timeline. Agree, agree. Um, I frequently hear. I mean, I don't, I don't, I won't put you on the spot with this, but to have a guy say he has five friends who died by suicide. Oh, uh, way more than that. I, I would say is like the minimum. Yeah, yeah. five, eight, ten. Um, and I think we could almost just put a pin in that right there. Um, there's a chapter on suicide in the book, and the way you know some of the perspectives on suicide, some of the ways that suicide affects people. Um, And I I hate the word survivor, but my, I hate to apply the word survivor to myself, but um, my brother died by suicide many years ago. So I I have a... It's an accurate term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shame. Sense of guilt. Sense of guilt for surviving when the others didn't. Survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Loss of empathy. That's a real thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. I have a good friend right now who, who has a, a very close family member who is very, very ill. And, you know, I can kind of kind of see. And as we've talked about it a little bit is, you know, I mean, he's doing everything from a behavioral perspective to be supportive and there. So, you know, his family member is not missing that at yeah. all. Um, he's dedicated beyond belief from a behavioral perspective. But he acknowledges just there's a, a coldness there that's, you know, hard for him really to feel. feel you can it. find it again. Yes. Things that are lost can be found again. Yeah. You first have to recognize where you're at in that journey. How'd you find yours? Time. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. My it was mom t- died seven days after I'd gotten home from being overseas. Never shed a tear for her dying because when I walked into the room, I was listening to people talking to her about how... She needed to keep fighting the good fight. You know, she mm. and I understand why people say that, but my first thought that went through my head as I walked through that door was she's dead or dying. She's going to die. Mm. But I had gone from a 10-month deployment 
the day before I had gotten on the helicopter, I had killed three people, put my guns away, checked everything back in, started my travel back to the U.S. I was in a very binary headspace, mm-hmm. black and white. Mm-hmm. You have to have time to get yourself unwound from that. Okay. I was not in a space when I saw my mom where I could be the son that I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, and you did you have that awareness in the moment? Yes. Yeah. I knew it was fucked up. I knew it was wrong. Yeah. But I also don't try to fight the thoughts that I have because you can either grab onto them or let them go. Yeah. I try not to grab onto them and I just let my brain do what it needs to do. But I did recognize like this, this is not normal. And I knew why it wasn't normal. You cannot go from an environment like that, making those decisions to all of a sudden a place where people are clearly telling a woman who's dying that she should fight to continue to, it's like, the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. Right. And that's normal because I mean, the, the physiological explanation would be habituation. You've habituated to death and dying. You're not habituating. You are acclimating yourself to the speed you need to make decisions. You have to cut all the bullshit out so you can make decisions as fast as possible. But that does lead to a certain amount of habituation. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. Yeah. So what I, when I said I don't buy it, what I guess what I meant is I don't buy that it was simply time. Time helps. Time and awareness. Having the time, but was there a process of self-reflection? I realized that I was different than the person that I was. And yeah. I recognized that in a lot of the deployments that I did. You literally car, it's, it's about making decisions. You, if you look at the training and the selection that we do, it's about following procedure, regardless of what's going on in the world around you and solving nonlinear problems as they're thrown into your face. Mm. The faster you can do that, the more likely you're going to be able to survive. Mm-hmm. You have to get out in front of your enemy's ability to make decisions. So you are forcing them into behavior. That's like the overall mm-hmm. best case scenario. If you don't keep track of that, you're going to be fucking Patrick Bateman running down a hallway with a chainsaw in American Psycho. I recognized feeling differently and wanted to be back more towards the person I was before. Okay. You recognized it and you had a desire to go back to some previous baseline that you had some... I want to be the person that will give a guy an opportunity to do the right thing at the coffee shop versus... Yeah. 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 Which I'll be totally honest, crossed yeah. my mind is why don't I just wait for him at his fucking car when he gets off of work now that we've identified like that's not the person I want to be. There it is. I want to be the person that sees the flaws in themselves and other people. There it is. And that's an ongoing process for all of us. If we have that awareness, if we make that effort. But it took time. It took time, but it also took the effort yes. and the awareness. Yeah. yeah. That's, my, that's my only point. Oh. Uh. A lot of guys lose faith in God or humanity. Or and, didn't have it to begin with. Or didn't have it to begin with. <laughs> I served with some of the most devout people mm. and people who I don't know if they believed in anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Most everybody was in between those. Yeah. Those were some fringe yeah. cases. How about the, uh, uh, how did it feel when you got out? Loss of purpose, loss of mission, loss of tribe. A lot of guys I miss mean a little bit. things, miss the action, miss the people, miss the sense of purpose and meaning. And, you know, you're doing something. Yeah, you but know? why? Why are you missing those things? Is it because you are unable to, like, imagine yourself as something beyond that? Yeah. You can buy a fucking Trident for $3 on the Internet. What does it actually mean? Is it who you are or is it what you do? Yeah. For me, it was what I did. I was very proud of the fact that I was able to do that job. But I never let myself believe that that's who I was. Never missed it. I miss it every day. But I also realize that it's a job yeah. with an expiration date on it. Okay. Like you are going to time yeah. out from any job yeah. that you do in the military. Yeah. If you spend all your entire life looking in the rear view mirror, mm-hmm. you miss everything that's beautiful in front of you in the windshield. Yes, true. But that doesn't make it easy. doesn't mean it was easy. Life is not easy. Yeah. Here's, here's a thought. The fucking job we did wasn't easy. Yeah. Why don't you apply yourself that hard to the transition process? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it's attainable. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not trying to judge anybody, but they used to ask us to do things that were nearly impossible and we succeeded. You're telling me you can't figure out how to get the fuck out of the military. That's yeah. Yeah. But that's it right there. It's hard and it's harder when you have a TBI. Welcome to the real world. Yeah. There's your empathy. 
I have empathy, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I'm going to lie to people. Everybody struggles. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Agreed. Did you ever feel, did you ever feel any sense that you'd been let down by your government? Oh, God, yes. Or officers? Oh, that's a whole podcast in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But the government is too fucking big to be successful at anything. Mm. And I also, there's a lot of people who, uh, from a boots, and in my opinion only, boots on a ground perspective, who think that they should be able to shift policy. It's like, look, can you please recognize where you are mm -hmm. in this cog or mm -hmm. the, in the wheel, mm -hmm. what your cog and what you do? I never set foreign policy. I was never asked my thoughts on foreign policy, which is smart because I don't know shit about it. Right? I was like a junior enlisted SEAL and then a junior mm -hmm. officer. I recognize that I don't have the ability to determine which hand or which direction the hand on the wheel of the government is going to go. Mm -hmm. I had to accept what my role in that was if I wanted to go down in that occupation. Does that mean that I always agree with it? No. But in, even if you work for yourself, you're going to have to make decisions that you don't agree with completely, the lesser of two evils. So get over it. It's an easy thing to hang your hat on and blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. You're the one who volunteered. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of small text in writing and all these documents to you know join the military. Mm -hmm. Read them. Mm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, an E five SEAL should not be consulted on national matters of foreign policy. I sometimes wish they were. It's gonna be a lot of like a hammer nail scenario. <laughs> and I deeply love them for that, but there's a time and place for it. <laughs> love the E five SEAL. Mm. Maybe not the best to negotiate trade deals with China. You know, <laughs> could they be any worse? <laughs> Fuck, I don't know. And what we got? Uh, yeah. Is it possible to do the job and not hit most of those metrics? I think it's impossible to do the job and not end with a, a, a significant traumatic brain injury. So then, which then so leads? What do we do then? Which then leads to hormonal imbalances, which leads to you know. Da, 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 da. These things all are interconnected. And having one problem exacerbates the others. If you can't sleep, your testosterone can't recover. Oh, so many of the symptoms overlap between like TBI and post-traumatic stress as well. The, the Venn diagram overlap there is unbelievable. Yeah. I think it was like, what, 12 of the 16 symptoms? Yeah. Well, but TBI has some very specific physiological. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a physiological injury. I consider PTSD to be a physiological injury. In fact, that's what I say to people. This is what I say to responders and veterans and soldiers is, you know, I mean, I know there's stigma and such, but it's all physiological injuries at the cellular level, molecular level. What is the stigma? Um, well, you started it. You started off with uh, saying you didn't want to believe about operate. You don't like the term. I didn't say I didn't want to believe. I said I hate the term. You hate the term because it, it applies. applies to you. Yeah. Yeah. But we need people to do that job. We absolutely do. But if we know the damage that it's going to occur, what do we do? Okay. So I've, you know, the operator syndrome, the perspective, or it's a framework. And you can use the framework to understand the course and the arc of injuries. And, you know, by the time, you know, let's say a 20-year career, by the time you retire, you have more injuries than you did in year one. Yeah, that's for sure. More severe injuries. Um it's also a framework you can use at that year one and year two and every year along the way to maybe to manage and mitigate the injuries and to use it as a performance enhancer, a framework for performance optimization. And, and a lot of what I do is on that side of things, helping, individuals, helping guys um, optimize their functioning and their performance at, at an earlier part of the career. Yeah. Um, there's many things we can do. Um, and, and I just want to make this point before I talk about SEAL Future Foundation. I work with a lot of foundations, and I work, I've worked with, you know, a lot of our conversation is focused on SEALs, but I, I probably work with more Army yeah. Special Forces than I, than I have SEALs. The communities I've, are defined by their similarities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I just don't want anybody, to, any group to feel left out because yeah. I do work with, with Air Force. I do work with Marines. I, I'm doing work right now with Canadian SOF, Can SOF. Do you any work with the Space Force? Um <laughs> No, I was thinking about that earlier today. As there's an art, I mean, they've been in the news recently with these 
with with some of the revelations that that America is falling behind. Um, I don't even know what the fuck they do. I don't either. Uh, I've had a, I've, I've talked to two people from Space Force. I want to join right. just because their uniforms are amazing. Are they? Oh, there's like a weird uh, camouflage pattern. And I would like to volunteer to be a door gunner on the space shuttle. That would be awesome. Like a minigun, but lasers? Like, mm-hmm. yes. Shooting at other space satellites or shooting down at the Earth? Well, I mean, why put limits on any of this? Yeah. That's, Who knows what's going to strike you in the moment? That's the new high ground. <laughs> uh, Space. Yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is. I've had. Con- I've talked to two different uh, Space Force uh, folks who reached out to me specifically to talk about operator syndrome, and, and we had a few conversations, and, and that was it. Um, so what do we do? So, uh, so I. So there's some amazing foundations out there. Um, and anybody who, who's interested can go learn about them. Hunter Seven, I've, I've talked about. I give mm-hmm. them a huge shout out. Chelsea and her folks, are, what they do is just incredible. Donate money to Hunter Seven if you want to donate because they don't have enough money and they are in the forefront of uh, helping all of the veterans um, in America with regard to cancer. And it's not just that they pay for and help help yep. at the individual level. They're doing research and such that's, that I think is going to be groundbreaking. Um, probably the foundation I work the most closely with is SEAL Future Foundation, and there's a Operator Syndrome Foundation that uh, uh, former SEAL Dave Rutherford has, has started. They I know Dave. Yeah. yeah, they haven't quite launched yet. That's uh, that's coming next month or the month after, um, and I have a small role with them, but but uh, I think they're going to be good. Um, but let me talk about the SEAL Future Foundation. Uh, that's the the, the group I've worked most closely with. And do you know anything about SEAL Future? I do not. And it's only because there are so many SEAL so many, centric yeah, foundations yeah, that I lose yeah, a little bit of who yeah, is focusing on yeah, what. I yeah. have heard of them for sure. Yeah. yeah if pressed, yeah. I couldn't tell you no, what they no, focus that's, on. No, no, that's fair. That's totally fair. And there are a lot of, and that's part of the problem. There's so many foundations. Where do you start? <laughs> yeah. Who do you call? Who do you donate to? Who do you respect? Who's, who's stealing the money? Who's actually using the money properly? Um, Seal Future Foundation has a has a health pro. They have health, education, and career and mentoring. And I've worked with them for now three years. Two years ago, we created a health board of advisors. Uh, we've got sixteen, fifteen or sixteen people from around the country. Um, some folks you know, like Kirk Parsley, mm-hmm. uh, Sean Mulvaney, um, who's a pioneer in stellate ganglion block therapy, but also a former SEAL himself. Mm-hmm. Chelsea Simone is on on the on it. Um, Gabrielle Lyon. Um, doctor, right? Doctor. Oh, yeah, I've heard her name. Doctor she, Gabrielle yeah. Lyon. Yeah. She has doctor. a tour. <laughs> doctor. And she has her own podcast. I'm yeah. going to be on it uh, in, in one of these days. And um, phenomenal endocrinologist at the University of Michigan, Rich Aukus. And, you know, I, sorry, everybody, I can't, I'm not going to give a shout out to all the names. Um, but it's multidisciplinary and it covers the different range of, of, of medical expertise. So we have endocrinology, we have neurology, psychology, psychiatry, um, advanced practice nursing, occupational therapy, or farm, farm, pharmacists, um, several gen- general internists, and some other specialties as part of the group. Um, Kevin Lace, uh, mm-hmm. former, uh, former SEAL, and now physician's assistant. So the way it works is uh, if you were to call uh, the number, you would talk to a SEAL, former SEAL, um, and and I need to add this caveat: they don't work with active duty guys, only or only separated. Okay. But and I think this is the model. This is a good model for other foundations. You call, you talk to a, a former team guy who who was a medic or you know a corpsman um, or an eighteen Delta if at other found at, for you know other um, branches, and they have a long conversation with you. Um, SEAL Future Foundation uses the operator syndrome uh, framework, but what they're doing is they're working to help you figure out what your needs are. They're not prescribing. They're not telling you what your problems are. It's just they're trying to just give you advice and guidance. Then they will lay out some treatment options for you. And we have treatment options now that are that are phenomenal. Not saying we have the Holy Grail. And, you know, this is not one diagnosis. This is many diagnoses in the framework. So it's 
it's going to require different treatments for different things, obviously. But they will work to get, help you get your hormones tested and treated. They will work to get you um, into a regenerative medicine clinic for chronic pain and headaches. Uh, they, they refer a lot of guys to receive stellate ganglion block therapy, which brings down the headaches for some mm -hmm. and certainly is, is a, a real game changer in bringing down anxiety and hypervigilance, which then helps people sleep better. Ketamine therapy, um, four to eight sessions of ketamine therapy is, is very... 48 or four to eight? I'm oh, sorry, four up to eight. I was going to say, that's a fucking roller coaster ride. <laughs> Strap in. <laughs> four, four, five, six, seven, or eight sessions, which you can do in a, in a month. I don't like that shit. They gave me ketamine when I had my surgery. Mm. Oh, yes, because it's used as an anesthetic. Well, it's disassociative, too. Yeah. I was asking my wife why I could hear clapping in the room, and it was just yes. the hairs inside yeah. of my ear canal talking to me. Yeah, yeah. I actually told the dog, I'm like, no more. Some, I don't care. Some people like it. I was not one of those people. So, um, but we can use, it's FDA approved for, to treat depression now. I don't know how much I care about FDA approval. Well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. That's fair. Yeah. But it helps a lot of people. And, um, oh, I'm not saying it doesn't work. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah. I, I didn't like it. You, I've never <sighs> tried it. And I've never they received. gave me, though, a pain reduction dose. From my understanding, it's a smaller dose for the uh, therapeutic sessions. Yes. Yes. They didn't spit me into orbit, but I think I was pretty close. <laughs> yes. You had the Star Wars experience. Oh, most. Yes. Yeah. So also you had other things. It oh, yeah. It wasn't just ketamine. It was probably- I had some Dilaudid in there. Yeah. It was right before surgery too. Probably three or four other yeah. uh, compounds. So it's used we as- We going for a ride. It's used as an adjunct yeah. to uh, anesthesia prior to trauma surgery. Um, some of us think- that using receiving the ketamine and the stellate ganglion block in the same week, same month, is symbiotic, that they mm -hmm. enhance each other. And there's a hypothesis that they help heal the brain. Interesting. So that's being tested now. I mean, a lot of us have seen that anecdotally and suspected that anecdotally, but it's being empirically tested now. Other good treatments that we're using, well, of course, psychedelic medications. You've probably had Marcus Capone or... I have, and Amber, yeah. Yeah, Amber. I've had quite a few people on. I have my concerns about yeah. that particular pathway. Yeah. I've seen guys where it becomes about their enlightenment mm. as opposed to actually doing any work, and then yeah. it just becomes about them going yeah. back. And yeah. I'm not here to judge. I just, mm. I, I worry, I think that one's incredibly beneficial, but can be a double-edged sword, which probably actually implies to damn everything, everything in life. Everything, yeah. yeah. Well, and we don't have, we, we have some research we have some research. The, there was an ibogaine study that just came out a few weeks ago, done, done at Stanford, f funded by VETS, mm -hmm. the Marcus and Amber Capone Study um, Foundation. That really promising results. It's not a randomized control trial. Yeah, uh, but the signal is is really promising. What we don't know is how to get the most out of it. What's the right dose? When is the best time to do it? What yeah. uh, what are, what kind of other therapeutics should we do with it? And you know, I think the thinking, the common wisdom right now is that you should be uh, that there should be a whole preparation ahead of time, including maybe journaling, maybe yep. a psychotherapy, and that that should continue well afterwards. And it's not the kind of thing that you you know I've heard of guys that you know rushed off, did it, and then we're back. At, you know, did it on a on a weekend, and we're back at work on Monday. I am familiar with those people as well. Yeah, that's probably not the way to do it. That's probably not the right way to do it. Not if you wanted to actually have the impact. The people right. that I know who've been the most changed did the dieta beforehand, cleaned up their diet. Yes. Or training, yes. focusing on sleeping, like yes. you said, journaling, all of those things. Yeah. And they went into it with a very intentional approach. Yeah. Not, hey, give me the magic medicine, yeah. and I'll talk to Jaguars right. as they run Y, and I'll right. be better. Right, right, Uh There's a... Have you heard of the MERT treatment? I don't think so. It's a transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is TMS, also FDA approved mm -hmm. for depression. Um, but what they do, and, and this, this, this treatment seems to be really kind of interesting, is that they use EEG readings ahead of time to dial in the precision of the transcranial magnetic stim. Hmm. So it's TMS that's, that's like a more advanced. It's like a... You know, it's it's precision guided using EEG. Interesting. And you know, the, the data look really good. Uh, Air Force is starting to use this proactively. Now, Very interesting. I, now, I believe, or at least they're they're studying it <coughs> proactively, like with with operators um, who are still active duty as a way of enhancing 
their performance and maintain helping trying to maintain their brain health while they're while they're active duty. I like it. Yeah. And then of course everything else. We got to treat your cancer. We got to you know do whatever we can to help your vision and your hearing if we can. And how do we stop the suicides? Well, I think one thing is awareness of that it isn't just depression. It isn't just PTSD. PTSD is an easy button. And if you don't identify with PTSD, uh, and many don't, uh, many don't accept that as their problem, and they're, they may be very right that it's not their problem, um, they may feel hopeless. Because if you go to the VA, what do you get? Oh, you got PTSD. Here's your therapist. Here's a bowl of medications. Um, and you might have, you might end up with three to six different psychiatric medications. It's that, a wild ride. Then that doesn't help you because that doesn't help your hormones, doesn't help your brain heal, doesn't help you with sleep apnea. And it's, you know, it, 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 these things can take on a life, it can take on a life of its own and you have no understanding and then you get isolated and then your wife leaves you and takes the kids. That clock becomes a pretty easy. Um, From a clinical perspective, if somebody has made that choice, what are the like, what's the likelihood of changing their mind? Well, I have never had anybody that I know of yet take their life that I was working with or talking to, and that includes yeah. my time at the VA. So I don't exactly know, but I've had a lot of people who were at that point. I've had phone calls in the middle of the night. I've taken calls at all hours. Um, Those aren't the people I worry about. I know. It's well, the ones who won't pick up the phone. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how you solve that because they're yeah. just quietly eating it. Well, I think the the isolation becomes the scariest predictor. Yeah, but you can isolate me. yourself in a crowd. That's what I mean. Is somebody who's just kind of pulled back from all of their human connections, whether they're, you know, in a football stadium. I've seen it where they'll have it at, at a surface level, like they can maintain. Mm. They can maintain. A modicum of normality where people will mm -hmm. not give them a second look, mm -hmm. but they're not there. Yeah. We don't know much about suicide. Yeah, it's kind of tough to do an interview. The people who admit to or acknowledge being having ideation, the people who have a plan, the people who survive an attempt are all at risk for sure. Yeah. And you can, people who have died by suicide, you can often look back afterwards and see those things. But most people who have those things never take don't take their life. Yeah. Um, so it is hard to study. It is hard to understand. We, you know, I, th I think. I think I don't know. I don't either. I don't know if there is a solution to it. I mean, I think we have to try, and you know, awareness is is one thing. Letting people know there are things out there. Um, finding those people that are isolating uh you know a guy named johnny wilson yes yeah so johnny has peripherally okay. like not like a close yeah. friendship johnny's a former seal who who started seal future foundation he founded it about a decade ago or 12 years ago now and he has a um he's a private company that he started and um, worked with them a little bit and they've developed an app and, it, and it's still a startup phase so mm -hmm. they're still looking to get um, investor money to kind of take it up to the next level. But the idea of the app, which which is fairly well brought along, is it's, it's designed to take all the information we can get from you, from your wearable. That's maybe not a wearable. It is. And it I'm is. doing it specifically okay. to track uh, sleep data. S that's what I do. I use the Whoop yep. uh, specifically for to track sleep. Um, and it takes that data and it takes some self-report data that you input and it asks you questions, like one or two questions a day. Mm -hmm. You know, rate, rate your mood or rate whatever. Um, and it creates a, you know, a lot of apps give you a recovery score for your day. Yeah. Uh, Don't do anything today. Fuck you, watch, I got stuff to do. <laughs> or, they're, or they're numerical, you know, on a zero to 100% This thing level. rates my naps. Your nap was great, but it was too long. It's like, motherfucker, if I really? wanted judgment for my watch, I would have asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> that nap was glorious. <laughs> I, I just don't re I just don't read my uh, coaching statements. I just look at the I numbers. mean, I'm curious. I'm like, but, God, you're judgy. But you can look at the, just look at the data. I do. Yeah. 
That the, was part of the data. The actual data. No, that's the interpretation of the data. I was curious what AI was telling me what I should do yeah, with my well, sleep cycle. Yeah, well, <laughs> now you know. Now you know not to listen to AI. I haven't looked at it since. I'm like, fuck you, Judge. You watch <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you. So take that data. Uh, you know, will this work perfectly? Who knows? But the idea is to give you a read. But the, the, the piece of it that I like, is, and I'm a big proponent of peer, peer programs. Talked about peer review earlier. Peer programs. Yeah. So you're more likely to talk to somebody who, who you, not I don't mean you, yep. literally you, but operators are more likely, we're all, all of us are more likely to talk to somebody who maybe we think can understand us. And, yeah, and, for sure. As a sense. So um, the idea is that if you, if you use this product, if you use this app, and it's agnostic, so whatever wearable you use, it will, it will work with, with yeah, that Yeah, it data. just parses the data yeah, out. Yeah. So the idea is you have a, you have a swim buddy or a battle buddy, or maybe more than one. And you're all kind of connected on the same thing. So you can see, not not all of their data, but you can see kind of their trend, yep. data trends. And then you get alert if somebody is trending down in a way that's looks dangerous. So you get, a, you get an alert. Hey, um, Brother Joe is having a really bad time. Hmm. And it, it pings you, and, and you have the opportunity to reach out to him. What's the app called? Uh, the company's called Envy, I N V I. I N V I. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a group I'm working with up in Canada called Pyroc, P Y R O C, is was started by a Canadian firefighter, career firefighter, a woman, Janie Miller, and um, you know the I kind of the idea. And by the way, she found me on a podcast saying, and she she kind of reached out. This was three years ago, saying, you know, operator syndrome. You know, responders have a version of this. Not exactly the same, mm -hmm. but but we've since kind of mapped a lot of this framework onto responders. Um, and it makes sense. We, we talked about this kind of at the beginning. Yes, a lot of similarities. Yeah, a lot of similarities. Um, and let me know when, when, when it's time. How long have we been going, Michael? 2.52. Okay. We should try to keep it to under... Under three? Three hours. Okay. Tell me everything you know in seven minutes. Yes. I can do that. So the idea I could do it in one because I don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the the idea here, the concept is to take all of the data, big data approach. So your wearable, your um, your the the things you did today, like for firefighters, it would be the nine one one calls they yep. had, the radio signal traffic, the functioning of the other people on the team, medical history, medical records writing samples, um, everything, and uh, put that together as a guide uh, to help you. Um, I know. think that the magic in all of this is going to be found in the actual data itself. And I don't know if we have enough yet, but I think the more that we can gather, the better. And, and bringing in data like from, you know, they've got things now, you've got respiratory masks that actually catch the yeah. the, t the substances, the toxins that... that there's that, that, there's the uh, pressure sensors on helmets there. You know what I mean? There's so many things yeah. now where they're uniform able, sensors. Yes, right, right. And that stuff yeah. is going to add yeah. another layer. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, what I worry about the most is people who find themselves in a place where they become hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of the reason we are seeing so many suicides in the, in the special operations community now is the habituation to death. Yeah, it does. It's certainly exposure to it. You forget that most people never are with somebody in their last moments, yeah. or let alone had a hand in those yeah. last moments arriving. It's, yeah. uh, it's a very heavy thing, and I actually wish I could experience it more fully sometimes um, because that's a tough one to unwind from too. Yeah. You know, you recognize the difference. Yeah. It's uh, not easy. You realize you're like that something's a little bit different here. There's something I'm not gonna say wrong. Yeah. There's something different. Yeah. Death is very intimate. It can be. And especially how you arrive there. Yeah. Well, I mean, even killing somebody in close quarters, there's an intimacy in that, I would I would think. Probably less intimate if you're like solo off a bridge. Intimate for yourself, but you know. Nobody else well, I guess somebody shoved you. See now, I'm just going to start getting creative. Though <laughs> it's, good, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. We're running out of. We're, we're Close it out, Doc. What do you want to okay. leave people with? Okay, I want to leave people with the idea that there's there are things we can do to help the community of responders and soldiers and and operators in particular. Of course, is, is the title of the book. 
Um, one group that's left out of all of this are the private defense contractors. Mm -hmm. And they're an invisible community. I talk about them in, in my book. I've worked with a lot of private defense contractors. They're operating, many of them. They're doing the same job, uh, they're doing a the job same. under a different flag. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Social media, where can they best, uh, the book's not out yet. So where, when it does come out, when they, where can they find it? Oh man, I don't know. It's, I know it's on Amazon. This will actually be out early March. So it'll be March, March 26. Okay. Yeah. So a, a few weeks after this airing. Yeah. You can, you can find it on Amazon. You can order it directly from the publisher Ballast Books. And if you order it from Ballast Books, they're going to start shipping them out next week, I think. Oh so, damn. So pre-orders will. Maybe it doesn't come out March 26th. Well, the pre-orders are, are getting a, a pre release, I guess. I don't I like know. You. I don't know what you call that. I also have some crime novels that I've written over the years that are going to be republished okay. this, this year. So I'll come back for another show on that maybe. If or I... send me the links to where people can get those and I'll put them in the show notes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you for coming all the way from Hawaii. I'm very grateful for your time. I'm really glad we had this conversation. Thank you, Andy. I enjoyed it. Yeah, me yeah. too. Thank you. It's cool.